This is Jocko Podcast number 180 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. It was May 1968. We were triple volunteers. We had volunteered and graduated from the Army's Parachute Jump School at Fort Benning, Georgia, made it through the qualification course at the Special Forces Training Group in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and after attending the 5th Special Forces Group Airborne In-Country Training Program, we had volunteered to serve in MACV SOG's Command and Control. During Special Forces training at Fort Bragg, several of the Green Berets teaching various courses told us to avoid C and C because the duty was rough and the Special Forces casualties were high in the top secret unit. Despite all those warnings, Rick Howard, John McIntyre, Rick Estes, Tony Harrell, Mark Gentry, Bob Garcia, Bobby D. Leathers, myself, and a few others volunteered to serve in CNC. I'd been in training or in between training cycles since entering the Army on 1 December 1966. In May 1968, we were finally shifting gears from being in a training mode to an operational mode. None of the rumors prepared us for what followed. You won't need those, the sergeant major said. Put away all pens, pencils, and notebooks. This is a top secret briefing. All of you have either obtained a top secret clearance or will do so in the near future or you wouldn't be here. Welcome to the Command and Control Detachment of the 5th Special Forces Group Airborne, 1st Special Forces, United States Army Special Operations Augmentation Study and Observations Group, or simply CNC. Gentlemen, before you is a confidentiality agreement. You can't tell your girlfriend, your mother, no one. We were prohibited from writing anything about the operation, forbidden from keeping diaries, taking photos, making drawings or tape recordings, notes of any sort. The Sergeant Major advised us that anyone who didn't want to sign the agreement could leave. Gentlemen, the Sergeant Major turned toward a generic map on the wall. The North Vietnamese Army controls these neutral countries and pointed to Cambodia and Laos located to the west of the Republic of South Vietnam and, of course, North Vietnam. For several years, the North Vietnamese Army had moved soldiers, supplies, rockets, guns, and propagandists south into the eastern provinces of neutral Laos and Cambodia through an ever-increasing network of trails and roads called the Ho Chi Minh Trail Complex. Now listen up real close, the sergeant major said. When you go across the fence, you will carry no identification of any manner, shape, or form. That meant no identification papers, no dog tags, no diaries, no photos, no love letters, and certainly no green berets. Everyone would wear sterile fatigues with no company insignia, no name tags, no unit designators, no jump wings, or combat infantrymen badges. Why? Without giving anyone a chance to respond, he said that because Laos and Cambodia were neutral, the United States government could publicly proclaim that the U.S. respected that neutrality. Thus, if we were killed in Laos, Cambodia, or North Vietnam, the U.S. government would deny having anything to do with us. The United States government would explain that no Americans were stationed in Laos or Cambodia, which was technically accurate. The U.S. government had plausible deniability if we were killed or captured. And if captured, we were to speak a foreign language. Don't tell them who you are, he ordered. Remember, technically, under the terms and conditions of the Geneva Accords, your status is different than Air Force and Navy pilots shot down over North Vietnam. They're in uniform. They're identifiable as U.S. servicemen. CNC men don't fall into the category of prisoners of war. We were, in effect, spies, although the sergeant major never used that word. He also didn't tell us that spies had no protection under the Geneva Convention and that we could summarily be executed if captured. And that right there, that's some excerpts from the beginning 
of a book called Across the Fence, which is written by a special forces soldier in Vietnam named John Stryker Meyer. And in this particular case, it is an absolute honor for me to say that we have him here with us tonight to teach us about his experiences as a member of MACV SOG, Studies and Observations Command, Group Command, and Control Teams. Sir? Welcome. <laughs> welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to be here. That's quite Thank a you. welcome you got to Vietnam, huh? Yes, it was quite something. Absolutely. At the time, we had just watched the John Wayne movie, The Green Berets, on top of it all. So uh, we were all psyched. <laughs> we've seen the movie. We're ready. That's all it takes? And we've been forewarned. You know, when you go there, this is going to happen. A little guy's going to come out and ask for people to volunteer. So we said, yeah, right. No. When we were done, it happened. Before they shipped us out, a little guy comes out. We're looking for volunteers. And then uh, Johnny Mac goes, for what, Sarge? Can't tell you. Either you're in or you're not. <laughs> so we raised our hands. Next day, we're up in Da Nang for that briefing you covered. Dang. How, before we go, jump into that, yeah. how'd, you end, how'd you end up in the military? Where'd you grow up? You grew up in Jersey? Yeah, I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, Dad was a milkman, grew up in a milk truck, and uh, Mom was the uh, piano teacher, choir organist. And uh, uh, after high school, it took me two years to flunk out of college. <laughs> <laughs> Upon flunking out, in uh, 1966, I was working up in Yosemite National Park. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was a garbage man, fireman up there. And uh, the book, The Green Berets, came out. And my dad had sent me a letter saying, hey, that's it. You finally flunked out. You're going to get drafted. We got the notification here from the draft board. So I read the book, and I said, you know what? If I'm going to go, if I can get in with these guys, that would be a great challenge. And if I can do that, that's the way I want to go. Because at that time, with the Army, uh, eight weeks of basic training, eight weeks of advanced infantry, a month leave, and you're in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You could be with any regular conventional unit. And by that time, there had been enough stories about some issues, um, particularly when they were engaged in the regular North Vietnamese Army, that they were having some major issues and surprises at how strong the enemy was. Yeah. So um, give me some more training. I needed it. And what, when you were a kid, were you, did you play sports or anything like that? Yeah, um, I was never that good at it, but I, I loved baseball. It was a head game and football. And uh, my dad wouldn't let me play uh, football until my senior year of high school. So I had one year of football, but everything else was just like JV, Little League. Just love baseball. Why didn't you want you to play football? Didn't want you to get hit in the head too much? <laughs> that could be. <laughs> they didn't care back then, did they? Uh, you know what? I think it was more, well, in eighth grade, I hurt my knee playing soccer. Oh, and so they were worried about follow-up injuries there and still have your body in pe one piece when you go to college or wherever you're going to go, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, they were very conservative. I mean, you no, know, like, my mom, uh, she's an old farm girl from uh, Central Jersey, and she wouldn't. She was really unhappy when my granddad gave me a cap pistol. So that's the household we grew up in. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, eventually, we we went out, and learned about weapons a little bit along the way, and then of course, when this came along, then we got the real deal. And the the what was so 1966. So public opinion wasn't completely against the war yet, was it? In '66. No, but it was beginning. It was starting. It was starting. You you had people doing their protests and letters to the editor and uh, some of the fringe elements of society like we see today. Mm -hmm. so there's some of those parallels. But uh, you going down, how did your parents – you, your dad was on board, obviously, because he sent you the letter saying, all right, buddy. You yeah, well, it's like, what school did you fuck out of? <laughs> yeah, Trenton State College. <laughs> yeah, and then you, ha you just said I'm going to go to Yosemite to be a firefighter. Well, we had uh, a couple of buddies of mine that I've been in college with help me flunk out, <laughs> um, and we did much much serious drinking, just the you know just stupid young young and dumb. And, I have no uh, idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, so. Uh, they had a corrupt congressman that got us jobs in Yosemite that summer. <laughs> so good old Frank Thompson came through for us. We drove across, and uh, in fact, uh, in Manhattan, Kansas, we got hit with a tornado. June 12th, going across the Rocky Mountains, we had snow with the back window blown out of the car. So it was just fun. Yeah. A nice experience. Again, we drank a little bit too much there, but the first time, real job, real money, and then the, the reality check is just like, these guys are amazing. 
if I mean, if I can get even close to this, get the jump mm-hmm. school, at least get a taste of this. So that was the plan. How was the uh, how was the culture shock when you rolled into to uh, army boot camp? Well, by that time, I'd seen you know a couple dozen of the movies over time from the World War II movies. So you kind of knew what was coming. Mm-hmm. So um, early on, I had a uh, a friend of mine uh, whose dad had been in the army. He goes, "Look, when you go in." Just remember, this is like a game. They want to see if they can break you or not, and you just got to have the right mindset. And that stuck with me. So through basic, particularly with jump school, they come in and shake you out of bed 2 o'clock mm-hmm. in the morning for bogus inspections just to see if they could mess you up or break you a little bit. It's kind of like, okay, we all know this is a game. We all know we're training here. And uh, so that was the way we moved forward. And you guys could go right into the you got you could go right into the Q course. Like you could just do that pipeline. It was well, open for you. Well, because we lost so many people, they came out with what at that time we called the Baby SF course. So yes, and even to this day, some of the guys I went through training group with are still down at Bragg now training SF guys. And I mean we're biased, but we feel that if you come through basic advanced jump school and go right into the Q course and qualify. Go, now they have a pre-qualification, mm-hmm. then your qualification, and then you get the beret. Um, that there's no bad habits. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the sergeants from the old days when they came in, you you had to be an E5 above, more more time in grade, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And before they'd be even considered you. But um, they needed bodies. Well, the guys, and again, we're biased, so let me get the bias out front. It's the green kids that came in that went off and did the job. And eventually at SOG, um, by 68 and 69, the majority of the one zeros team leaders were young guys. And there's a lot of us mm-hmm. that either got bored, or like in my case, flunked out, or <laughs> just wanted some diff- something different. And said, this is special forces, and then you get the rumors, and then you finally get to that briefing where you say, hey, there's a chance to volunteer. Little do you realize there's the highest casualty operation in the entire war. Yeah. But they, they forgot to tell you they that. They didn't tell you that part? <laughs> <laughs> so did you did you volunteer for CNC while you were still stateside, or was that once you got overseas? No, at that time, uh, the only way you could get into Special Forces of that program was to enlist for airborne on assigned. And then when you went through basic, then at advanced infantry, you – uh, you would be uh, offered the opportunity to volunteer. So during one of the classes, they would have, you know, like in my case, it was a rainy day. We're in the gym. There's like 600, 700 people sitting on the floor. And they had the stage up front with side steps. And a cook would come up and say, hey, the coolest MOS. You'll never go hungry with us. And they're all fat and sloppy, you know, <laughs> traditional cooks. And then other guys come for Camo, yeah. Intel, MPs, that kind of stuff. And at the very end, this little banty rooster comes in, and it was raining. So everybody else had their rain jackets and stuff on. This banty rooster comes in with a beret, and his, and his fatigues are wet. He came up and did a straight jump on the stage, turned around and said, um, we're looking for recruits for special forces. If, you, if you're interested, see me outside. In fact, anybody interested? Well, hell, I read the book. <laughs> I jumped up off the floor. Me and about three other guys, and the other 700 just sat there. I'm going like, WTF? <laughs> you guys are going to nom in a couple of weeks. I'm going to get just a little bit more training yeah. here. It was just amazing. So yeah. he, he jumped off the stage, and that's it. So he ran us through the psychological test, had to show we could swim, run, all that stuff. And, and then, were you a calm guy initially? Did you get trained as a calm guy? Yes. Eight, is it? Did they still call oh. it 18 Echo back then or no? No, it's, this is prehistoric. Got O5B it. 4S. <laughs> the 4S is the uh, SF designator. Got it. And O5B is calm and Morse code. And then after training group, we sent they sent us down for 12 weeks to Fort Gordon for uh, RTT because they need a lot of the A camps and, of course, C&C needed some RTT operators, radio teletype. Mm-hmm. And so that was the extra training. And that's where I got busted. Me and Johnny McIntyre got busted down to private, E-Deuce. So when we landed in Nam. What would you, you, you do to earn that? Oh, well, we were just assholes, yeah. really. I mean, these are <laughs> these are butter bars. Two young lieutenants, they uh-huh. got this company, and here come these Green Berets. We just got done all our training. Yeah. We're official Green Berets you're, now, you're, right? You're the, you're the baddest man yeah. on the planet. Here and I tell you're with your buddy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 
when I have my Article 15 hearing with the CO, I go in and there's eight Article 15s on the table. He says, pick one. So I picked one, scrunched it up and threw it at him because you got nine now. <laughs> and I got, me and McIntyre got busted. So it was E-Deuce. Landed in NOM was an E-Deuce. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to so so it wasn't until you got to Vietnam, correct, that you heard about CNC. Or no, you said some training instructors right. had when told we, you like, hey, we went don't even Camo, trust. Well, you know, here one of these little sidebars, when we go through Camo, myself, McIntyre, and a few others got recycled because you had to get up to uh, I forget twelve or fifteen groups word, per minute or groups something per minute. Yeah, yeah. WPMs. Yeah. I had and, to do uh, that too at the, at is that the right? SEAL team. I went through a course, like one of the last guys that were learning Morse code, and we had to get whatever it was. I think we had a lower standard than that because we, because <laughs> it would just no one would have well, passed. You, were, you weren't even an officer then. So we couldn't give you the officer out, right? True, true. <laughs> so, no, but we, one of our guys who took us under his wing was a guy named Paul Villarosa, SFC, been in NOM three times, had a little tattoo around his neck, cut here. And uh, but he, he helped us. He got us gone. So in our mind, he and we had uh, Wagner and Russo, two other instructors for the O5B. And so when they got to know us near the end, it's like, hey, you guys go. Don't do this volunteer stuff. Get an A camp. Learn about the people. Blah blah blah. Okay, and that's what it came down to. So when we get that briefing, the top secret briefing, and one of the first things we hear about from Scuttlebutt, Paul Villarosa was KIA, the first KIA out of uh, FOB4 at the time, which was in January of 68. So here's one of our living legends who got us in the SF, trained us up, it's KIA. Mm. And that had a, you know, talk about PSYOPs, it hit hard. But you, but so that was in Vietnam when they for when they now said to you, okay, yeah. do you wanna be a part of this other program? Right. Do you wanna go one more volunteer yeah. route and end up here? Yes, sir. And of course you're like, yeah, let's bring it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Young and dumb. <laughs> and then, so then, so then you immediately got assigned. They right, said, "Do right they away. have to test you, screen you, anything, any, anything else?" Or they just said, "Okay, oh, you're 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 no, smart enough all, to volunteer." Yeah, <laughs> but that time, you on a all the vetting had been done, and uh, all of us either had the top secret or it was in process. And so, uh, from there, literally the next day, a plane to Da Nang up north, and then we had the briefing, and. Uh, and, of course, you know, we had a safe house in Da Nang where there's, there's House 22. That's our safe house. And welcome to Special Forces, you know. And that was a safe house that was run by either us or the agency mm -hmm. or both. And, um, you know, you go in, and here's old SF guys. In fact, there was one of the uh, teams that just got back from trying to rescue one of our hatchet forces. And they were just sitting there talking about the combat. And Mac and I are sitting there going, oh, shit, we're going to really die. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing we spent all our money. Cause we were <laughs> because when we were going through the uh, RT&T training, we had a weekend pass. We go up, we're in Washington, when we see the Tet Offensive, and the tanks are running over Lang Vey, the A camp at Lang Vey, A101. Mm -hmm. And we go, we, we know we're going to die with high degree of certainty. So we went home, took our money out of the bank, <laughs> <laughs> All of our princely earnings of $1,000. We ate steak dinners until we went to Vietnam. <laughs> so there we were at this House 22, and we're thinking about the same thing. It's like, oh, shit, we're really into it now. And so we go upstairs, take showers, and in the showers, a couple of these hookers that are in there douching out with, with Coke, Coca-Cola. Yeah. And they're cleaning up okay. just like welcome. You hear a couple of guys getting their load in the back there, and they're all pumping away. It's like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> they didn't tell us about this side of Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. So bring it on. We're ready. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, you you talk about that flight up to the first place you got assigned was was FOB one. FOB one. Yeah. Sorry, we we always called them FOB. Okay. Where you guys call it FOB in your yeah. generation. I guess yes. we're I guess we're cutting corners over here. Okay. So Indeed. you're going to FOB one. <laughs> call it anything you like. Still getting late for supper. <laughs> well, there's a whole there's a whole uh, there's a whole offshoot of the word FOB, which we turned into FOB. Have you ever heard the term FOBIT before? Yes. Yeah, so someone that stays yes. on the FOB and never goes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also so, known as REMPS. Yeah, well, yes, the REMPS is, is, <laughs> is what you guys called them. And I don't know if you, the, the name of my consulting company is Echelon Front. And the reason we called the company Echelon Front 
is because we wanted people to know that we were the guys that were like in the front in and front. not not the not the remfs, <laughs> which is specifically taken from David Hackworth's book. Indeed, I read, yes, run a ton, read a ton of times. Yeah, uh, me too. How was yeah, awesome. And flying up into FOB one, right with the King Bee. Yeah, how how was that? Oh God, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's just another day in the Secret War, you know, because they had the old H 34s, and so the pilots sit up high, and then you had the, the, the apartment in the back for the passengers, and there's a door gunner. So when McIntyre, me, and John uh, Hutchins get on the H 34s, the door is only on the right side. So we all get in, and I see the helicopter pilot going, I mean, the gunner going. Was the gunner Vietnamese? Yeah. This is all Vietnamese crews. Were you were you ready for that mentally? Not at all. Okay, <laughs> it's like yeah, because uh, that's one more important, novelty. Important note to make to everyone: so that the the aircraft is being flown by a Vietnamese pilot with a Vietnamese co-pilot and a Vietnamese gunner. Yeah, it was the two nineteenth uh, Special Operations Squadron for the South Vietnamese Air Force, and uh, all pilots. And so, you know, our training was we we're going to work with the people there, the indigenous people. But when you literally climb into their helicopter and your life is now in their hands, that's like, you know, we didn't, I'm glad you mentioned it because I didn't really think about it much, but it was it taking those couple steps, jumping in and going like, yeah, WTF2? What's going on here now? Yeah. I thought we'd have, you know, like Huey like we've seen in the movie with John Wayne. They all had Hueys, <laughs> none of this old H34 Sikorsky <laughs> thing. No, and that has it, and the engine in that was a B seventeen uh, rotary engine. Yeah, and we're going to get into the fact of yeah. how those guys prove themselves over and over oh and over and over again to be just incredibly brave and not not just incredibly good pilots, but just brave beyond comprehension. When you were flying up there, was it was it a mellow flight up there? Or was it was it, cool. Yeah, it was okay. a beautiful day. You know, it's warm, like it's always hot, but mm-hmm. once you get air, you get the flow. You know how it is when you're yeah. flying through. Yeah. And we're going over to cemeteries and everything, and we're going down Highway 1, which is heading north from Da Nang up to Fubai. And we went past the Fubai Airport, and so we're flying north on the west side of the Highway 1, and you see the airport, and then there's this big compound, which was the 2nd uh, Armored Division Training Cramp Company. And then all of a sudden, it's like you're flying north, and then you're on your side, Looking straight down at the road, you did a 90 degree flip as he begins his turn. <laughs> so I seen the guy talking, the door gunner, like doing a scrunchy thing, you know, because we all had our new fatigues, and you could just tell we're newbies, <laughs> disgusting newbies, green ass green berets, man. This guy's going to have his kick. So I was kind of thinking something's going to happen. Well, this is it. Well, McIntyre goes, geez, you know, and, and, and Hutchins goes the same way. And I'm watching the guy. He <laughs> so we did the, you know, you look down, there's the road. And it's the first time we'd had a helicopter with that kind of a radical ride. And so they did a 180, and then came back and did a 360 and landed. We get off. Well, we get off, and then a recon team gets on. Disappears. Yeah. Was that, was that? Spike Team Idaho that got on? Correct. Yes, okay. sir. So, so that the happens. That was the one zero. That's the bracelet right there. And that those the, you got off that bird that brought you into FOB1. Yeah. And, the, and it was Spike Team Idaho that got on board. Yep. Glenn they, Lane was the one zero, and Robert Owen was the uh, one one with four indigenous troops or five indigenous troops. And, and so you start your check-in and whatever, and then whatever, however many hours goes by, yeah. and all of a sudden, what's happening on camp when you start to realize that something's going sideways? Well, you know, I was very fortunate. When I'm with the training group, I was a catcher and played center field for our eight company softball team, and we went on to feed it that summer. And the reason why, Spider Parks, Robert J. Spider Parks was our pitcher, and that little skinny-ass Texan could bring it. <laughs> and we still played fast pitch, none of this wimpy slow pitch shit. <laughs> And so we won all our games. And uh, so I come in, we land McIntyre and I and Hutchins, and we're like literally walking in front of the S3 office. Just They had a long road that went from Highway 1 east into the compound. The training center's on the right. It's all new. We hear the Vietnamese and we hear Cambodians on the left as we go down and we get in and take our stuff out. We're just standing looking stupid. And then here comes Spider Parks. And it's like, whoa, am I glad to see you? Because we, we were both an A company together. Spent many months there training up before we came. And now he, 
But he wasn't the one that told you what was going on with uh No, because right at that point, it was like, hey, you know, I got a spare bunk. If He goes in, talks to the sergeant major, says, I know this asshole. I'm going to bring him in with me for a couple of days, and we'll see what's going to happen. Because at that point, uh, Spider had been on Idaho, had run four or five missions with uh, Sergeant Lane. And then Lane said, you're ready for your own team. So he promotes him off. They appoint him as a 1-0. And so he was in that interim time waiting for the transition to come where he's going to get assigned a team. And uh, so he's in base. The team goes out. So he's got a high degree of interest in what, what their status is. So they missed the first combo check. They gave a team okay, which in our case, once you're on the ground, you usually wait about 10 minutes to see what's going on around you. Gave a team okay. Then the assets leave because they can't stay that long anyway, mm-hmm. at least the helicopters. So they head back. Which the team okay was uh, break and squelch on the radio? Right. Generally? Generally speaking, yeah. Uh, so for those of you that don't know what that is, is when you break, you squeeze the handset on the radio, it, it, you can tell on the other end, okay, they just purposefully squeeze that microphone three times. We know that that's the signal for okay. Right. And sometimes uh, early on the guys may say, um, team okay, but mm-hmm. yeah, later on that's all it was, just break, break. And then they say, okay, then Covey would leave. So they were in, and then Spider came back. Later he goes, hey, we haven't heard from Idaho. So by dinner time, hey, we haven't heard by Idaho. We haven't heard from them. We're really concerned about what's going on here. And then by the morning, uh, they're still at that point, not, not a word. And what, at what point did you guys get word? Uh, you know what? I'm hazy on how many, what the day or mm-hmm. time frame was, but eventually uh, – Another, they decided that it had been too long, no combo. They put in what they call a bright light, which is a team that goes in to either find the other team if there's casualties or down pilots. That's what the bright light missions were, down pilots, uh, bring relief or just bring casualties out or help people get the team out, the wounded team. So they went in, the team that went in, everybody was wounded. One guy was killed. This is from the team that went in? Went in for the bright light. This is, this is uh, Oregon. Correct. Yeah, with uh, Mike Tucker and uh, and George the Troll Sternberg, they went in and at one point they were thrown a hand. They were in a bomb crater, and so the NVA were hitting them with our weapons, Car 15 fire. They had our M26 frag grenades, one of which blew off George's jungle boot. So all these guys were really banged up pretty bad when they came out, and but the, they got out. And they but they didn't find anybody from Idaho. Correct. I'm going to take it back to the book here. This is sort of the this is this is the reaction back at FOB one when Oregon comes back. Back at base, there was a collective sigh of relief that ST Oregon had survived the short-lived but furious but ferocious bright light mission. The loss of ST Idaho, however, hung over the camp like an invisible fog. Spider was the first person I spoke to after that bright light. He went straight to the bar, unable to believe that ST Idaho had vanished. The complete lack of clues added to the mystery. Were they killed? Were they wounded, captured, and now prisoners of the NVA? McIntyre voiced everyone's next thought. Before he'd be captured by the NVA, he said he'd kill himself with a round from his car 15 or pretend to be dead and blow up as many NVA as possible with one final hand grenade. There was no doubt in my mind. I'd never be taken alive. From that day forward, I always carried an M26 frag grenade on the upper hook of my web gear. It was the last one I'd used, I'd, I would use. Welcome to CNC, McIntyre muttered. We had heard about ST Asp from FOB4 vanishing in Laos, presumed KIA on 28 March 1968. But there were others. Sergeant First Class Robert L. Taylor killed 4 April. S.T. Bear from FOB3, KIA, Laos. Major George Cuomo, U-17 crash, died 14 April. FOB5 based spike team members Sergeant First Class Leroy N. Wright and Staff Sergeant Lloyd F. Musau, KIA, Fishhook Area of Cambodia, 2 May. FOB2 based Lieutenant Joseph C. Shreve, KIA, Hatchet Force Operation, 1 May. 
FOB1 based ST Alabama team members specialist fifth class Kenneth M. Cryan and private first class Paul Chester King, KIA, A shall target for May. FOB1 hatchet for Sergeant First Class Ronald J. Miller, KIA 12 May. FOB1 based Master Sergeant Robert D. Plato and first and Sergeant First Class John Hartley Robertson, KIA <clears throat> King B Helicopter Crash Crash Laos 20 May. Additionally, five SF troops were killed at FOB3 from mortar and artillery shrapnel between 15 and 21 April 1968. Specialist 5th Class Charles M. Corey, Specialist 5th Class Daniel F. Sandoval, Sergeant Dennis Thorpe, Sergeant 1st Class Stephen Mazak, and Specialist 5th Class Samuel R. Hughes. McIntyre and I didn't personally know any of the KIAs, but the sheer number in that short period of time was sobering. Most of them were veteran Special Forces soldiers. Being as green as we were made us all the more nervous, but not scared enough to quit CNC. That's, uh, that's, that's quite, the, quite the welcome aboard. Oh, yeah, and then do, and one little side note on Spider Parks, um, on that bright light, when the team came out, they were so shot up <clears throat> because one of the team members got additionally wounded on the extraction that they never gave a team okay. Spider went down with a king bee, separate king bee, got out looking to make sure everybody was out. Mm. And he took, they took intense fire. That king bee got fired up. And on extraction, the door gunner was KIA on that. So Spider was um, quite a mess when he got back. Yeah, that's that was such a short period of time to be losing all those guys. That's a matter of months. Oh yeah, and we left several out. Um. So these uh, these spike teams going in. Exp- will you explain a little bit about what the spike teams were? Like what sure. it consisted of. The uh, spike teams was a code name for our recon teams. They had two basic elements with CNC: the hatchet force, which could be a company platoon or a company size operation, and then the recon teams, which we had, would be two or three Americans with uh, the corresponding number of indigenous troops. So initially we ran three Americans with three South Vietnamese. And the South Vietnamese on our team were really good. Mm-hmm. And then later, they were so good, I just ran myself on a 1-1 one, one with four indig. And, uh, we trained up heavily, particularly up to that, and then uh, um, learned who the best ones were. And we had a couple of the guys that had been, like Hep, our interpreter, Sal, who had been there. They'd been running missions for over two years by 68. So they were highly respected. In fact, um, only by the grace of God, they weren't on a team that disappeared because we were able to build around them. You have this other part in the book here. This is another sort of welcome to FOB1. During the during the first few weeks in FOB1, I attended at least three memorial services for fallen SF comrades. Services were held in the mess hall. The last one I attended was for Lane and Owens. During the service, the chaplain hesitated on Lane's name. This was the last official function honoring Spike Team Idaho's members, and the chaplain couldn't remember Lane's name. I didn't care if he had attended a dozen memorial services for other branches of the military that day. I was so angry I never attended another memorial service at FOB1. The services soon stopped anyway because there were so many casualties. No official announcement. They just stopped. (sighs) Yeah. You and I were talking a little bit about uh, Ramadi when we were in Ramadi and the you know one thing that we started doing immediately was going to the memorial services of the soldiers and Marines that were getting killed and that was a big wake-up call for everybody Uh, I I can tell you I don't think probably anyone in my task unit had ever been to a 
yeah, had ever been to a, a memorial service overseas for guys that have been killed. I mean, and here we were, they were, they were happening every day. You and never think about it. No. Until you're there. No. And you guys were having so many casualties that they just said, okay, well, we're not even going to have them anymore. Here's talking about some of your first few operations that you went on. And I don't think I've talked about this, but so these little teams that you had. Yeah. These little teams were getting into helicopters and flying over the fence, which means over the border, into Laos and Cambodia to do reconnaissance pretty much in the middle of nowhere by yourselves. Correct. This type of operation in present day is not very likely to happen. And the, <laughs> the amount of risk that you guys were taking, it's, it's crazy to read about. Like my, my personal contingency r- that I'm running through my head, you know, what if this happened, what if, what if that happens? Right. I'm, I'm looking at these saying, yeah, if I was the commander in charge, I'd say, well, you need to f- come up with a better plan. You need to come up with something where, where we have better backup. Especially when the situation is, because you guys can get air support and you guys used it heavily, but oh, yeah. as soon as the weather rolled in, it was like you guys are out there on your own. And I mean, we'll get into some stories where you're out there on your own. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And, yeah. you know, and uh, um, it's that, that element of it is uh, an extra contingency because we had no artillery, no traditional Army or Marine Corps support, that, and of course, no SEAL teams. Yeah. They were busy doing their stuff on the coast. And uh, so it was quite something to go across the fence. And in a way, we were flying into the 18th century because everything was so old, the way of working. And they used to do slash and burn agriculture. So mm-hmm. you come in with the helicopter, everybody would hear you coming. And the local people had to cooperate with the NVA because their model was work with us or we're going to kill your dumb ass. Mm-hmm. So um, the game was on. And the purpose of most of these was to figure out where the trails were, what was being transported, wh- where the location of enemy personnel were. It was, ba- it was your basic reconnaissance missions, right? Well, in addition to, yes, that was the first part. So you always had general missions, either a point mission, because uh, by the end of 68, they were building fuel lines from the north. They were coming down, and they were going across the DMZ River in Laos. And uh, so we heard reports about that. So that could be a point mission or a general reconnaissance, where the movement's gone, what the supplies are, and then wiretaps, POW mm-hmm. snatch, and uh, those were the other missions. And so our, our South Vietnamese were trained. We trained them up. So back then we had state-of-the-art, a cassette player, right? <laughs> 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 and Sal could climb up a telephone pole, hook it up, and covered a wire all the way up with mud, so if anybody walked past, they would never see that wire. And we would record, because the CIA told us, if you record, even though you don't hear anything, keep it on, because when you get those tapes back to us, we're gonna amplify it 100 times, because the North Vietnamese phones, even though we're in the cradle, they were still on. Mm. And we could record it, they'd amplify it, and they could hear people talking in the background and get intel off of that. So those are some of the other missions. So you start going on your first few operations here. Um, and by the next morning, back to the book, by the next morning the weather had broken and we were inserted smack dab in the middle of the biggest road running north to south through the Aishaw Valley. Am I saying that right? Aishaw. Aishaw Valley. Uh, there was no jungle. There were, however, hundreds of bomb craters of various sizes. But what surprised me the most was the number of punji pits that we passed. Some were huge, large enough for animals and you go through this mission this is one of your first missions and there's like no enemy contact and one of the guys who were with Walken and I looked at each other in complete disbelief we had just walked down into the valley of the shadow of death without seeing one NVA soldier spider joked with me saying that I was one of the few people in the history of CNC to have a run a practice mission and two missions and still have not gotten the combat infantryman's badge the award given to soldiers who had seen combat with the enemy or were under direct hostile fire I kept telling myself that this was a fluke, and I remembered what the Special Forces trainers told us at Fort Bragg. The NVA and the Viet Cong guerrillas will fight when they want to, no sooner. So your first couple of operations, you got pretty 
pretty lucky. Oh yeah, we're a slip snail snot. <laughs> <laughs> we went in because we put in those Air Force sensors, and then we had all this air, tack air stacked up because we just figured it's going to be a shit show. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. So we left out some poor, some poor NVA gunner opens up with a 50 caliber. They killed him several times, man. <laughs> Napalm, bombs, because they wanted to use something on this big mission, right? <laughs> Were you, uh, it, the other interesting thing that you talk about in the book, uh, I don't think it was one of yours, but uh, there were, even when you guys would do training missions over there, yeah. there was like a potential for enemy contact on your training missions. Absolutely. Yeah, Lynn Black and his team. They ran the heavy contact. In fact, it was the Navy that <laughs> saved their dumb ass off that one training mission because they just happened to have the frequency. The King Bees couldn't get in, and they called the Navy, and they came in on a, a big boat. Yeah, yeah, some kind of boat. Gun, That's what really we want. big guns on it. <laughs> but they came in and pu pulled their ass out because the uh, Viet Cong had mustered a couple hundred people that were coming after them. And they, they were just out trying to do like a shakeout patrol, yeah. just a little training operation. Yeah, just a little in-country thing, you know. Just, just go train, <laughs> get a couple of days, get out of camp, eat some eat some lerps, have some fun. <laughs> well, your, uh, your luck didn't hold up, I no. guess. <laughs> Going back to the book. And is this guy's name Sal? Am I saying that right? Perfect. Okay. By now, Sal eyes were, Sal's eyes were bigger than saucers. So you've been inserted, and now you, you're starting to have a situation unfold. If you raise Spider Walk and said, tell him I'm declaring prairie fire emergency. If he says anything about not hearing any gunshots, tell him to fuck off, I'll explain later. Sal's never been wrong. Look at him. As we spoke, Sal looked at us. Boku VC, Boku VC, call King Bees now, he whispered. And then you get on the horn, I have a prairie fire emergency, team in distress, I have a prairie fire emergency, can anyone hear me? I spoke in a hushed tone with my hand cupped over the mouth of the radio. I looked at my watch. We still had more than 100 minutes before our next scheduled combo check with Spider at 1600. No one responded. So the, the deal with comm windows are, back in the day, when we had batteries that would run out, <laughs> you couldn't just sit there and monitor the radio all the time. On either side, either, people that were waiting for you to call, they'd be waiting, and they didn't want to. They they wouldn't monitor the whole time, so they would come up at certain pre-designated communication windows. So that's what's going on here. You have this bad situation unfolding, and you go to call, but they're not particularly listening at that moment, which is why no one's responding. Right. Yeah, I'm just explaining that to some oh, yeah. folks that, because nowadays we have, well, first of all, we have cell phones where we call anyone whenever we want. It makes a nice <laughs> ringtone and you talk to whoever you want to. But even <laughs> when I got in, we had calm windows. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. We set up, I was a calm guy too. Sure, so yeah. We set up yeah. calm windows and we'll call you, you know, whatever it was, every two hours or whatever. And uh, that's the situation that's unfolding right here. You guys still hadn't been contacted yet. So back to the book, I sat down with my back against the PRC 25 and opened a can of apricots. I was facing south and just starting to sip the sweet apricot nectar when all hell broke loose. The green jungle around us erupted with deafening full automatic blasts from NVA AK-47s and R car 15s. Because my back was to them, I hadn't seen Sal's warning gestures or watched him get the jump on the approaching NVA. I remember spilling apricot nectar on the stock of my car 15 as I turned to my left where the majority of the NVA gunfire was coming from. Foolishly, my first thoughts were that I'd have to clean off the nectar off my weapon and not spill the entire can of apric apricots because I had waited so damn long to eat them. They were always a treat in the jungle. But the initial seconds of the firefight, I remember Sal and, how do I say his name? Fook? What? Oh, fuck, yes. Fuck, fuck yelling profanity, profanities at the NVA as they fired on full automatic. The crack of AK-47 rounds n had never sounded louder or closer. All I could see from our perimeter was gun smoke, the red and orange blast coming from the darker than ever green jungle, and the green AK-47 tracers flying over our heads. In an odd sort of way, there was an eerie beauty to the scene. The thunderous fury of dozens of men blasting away at each other on full automatic within 10 feet of each other killed all other sounds. The eardrums were numb. Adrenaline had slammed into our bloodstreams and was now screaming through our systems. It heightened all senses. It extended time. For example, a car 15 fires 20 rounds of 5.56 high velocity ammunition in less than one and a half seconds. Yet those first opening moments of combat with the NVA seemed much longer than a half a second. 
than the second and a half. Ordinarily, when firing on full automatic, the weapon expended rounds quickly and we trained ourselves to try and gauge when that last round in the magazine was slamming into the receiver. Some men placed a tracer round in the magazine as a visual cue. During that firefight, it seemed as though I counted the rounds leaving the car 15 and knew exactly when the 18th and last round was exiting the weapon. Also, during that first expa- exchange, Fook was slightly behind me to my right, and since I was on the ground, he was firing over my shoulder. That exposed my right ear to almost a full blast from his car 15. The explosions were painful, but Fook saved my life. I had aimed the car 15 down the hill toward the largest number of AK-47 muzzle flashes that I could see to my left. What I hadn't seen were a handful of a handful of NVA soldiers who broke out of the jungle to the right and had opened fire on us. Folk realized I hadn't seen the NVA troops coming up the hill, so he got to my right and blasted them back into the jungle. I was so focused on the first muzzle flashes that I had completely missed the others. If those NVA soldiers had advanced a few more feet, we would have been history, and the remainder of the team, which was on my left, would have been at risk. That time warp continued when everybody ran out of bullets simultaneously. The only audible, the only sounds audible were the metal clicks of cold magazines being slammed into hot machine guns and bolts slamming shut to resume the firefight. A key element in any firefight is the race to reload after the initial contact. On 7 October 1968, ST Idaho won the race. No one was faster than Sow Heap, Hep, Hep, Folk at getting the first magazine out, the second one in, and returning full automatic gunfire on the enemy. Within seconds, we had gained fire superiority. The months and months of training on the range under the tutelage of Spiner, Spider and Wolken all of the live fire drills, all the live fire races to see who finished reloading first paid off. All other games in life were frivolous and irrelevant. In this deadly game, if you missed hitting the target, you died. So that was your first big contact, huh? That was it. <laughs> That's a doozy. It was, absolutely. And uh, it still sticks with us, you know. you never forget it. And fuck, I mean, later on, we're back in base. I was complaining. <laughs> Cause I didn't realize what had happened. And so th- talking through Hep, the interpreter, he said, you dumb fucker. I just saved your ass. These guys were coming up the hill, and you're too stupid to realize it. Oh, so you were mad at him for shooting too close oh, to your yeah, ear? Oh, yeah, because my ear was just <laughs> fucked. I couldn't hear for days. <laughs> it's, it's like, so thanks for saving my life. I'm complaining, right? <laughs> oh, classic. Oh, yeah. Uh, you continue on with this a little bit as as we gained complete fire superiority I turned on the URC 10 beeper and started screaming into the PRC 25 I have a fucking prairie fire emergency that bitter fear laced plea was greeted with complete silence Woken was less than subtle keep yelling until you get someone a key factor in ST Idaho's favor that day was the small knoll that Woken has driven us to the jungle is so thick and the knoll was so small that only a score of NVA could rush at once they weren't, move, they weren't fast moving, fear inspiring charges that the NVA were known for successfully executing either. Here the jungle worked against them, but the NVA kept coming. At one point, Woken pulled me over, pointed into the jungle and said, look, they're stacking up dead bodies to get to us. Hip showed me, can you believe it? And they keep coming. Hell, if we kill enough of, the, of them, the body stack will be as high as we are. Because the jungle area was so dark, at first I couldn't tell exactly what I was looking at, but Wolken was right. The NVA were stacking bodies and firing at us from behind their dead comrades. A lot of NVA soldiers died in those first few minutes of hell on earth. That's a determined enemy. Oh, yeah. And we heard about, you know, it's one thing to, to, to hear about it basic and, and uh, special forces training, how determined the enemy was. And uh, to see it firsthand, dying like that, I mean, literally just kept coming. And we had high ground. You know, thank God for high ground, thick jungle, and the fact that it wasn't uh, a big a big area where they could mass more. You guys didn't bring a, you guys didn't have an automatic weapon with you? You guys didn't have an A-dub, like a, like a, like a belt-fed machine gun? You no. guys wouldn't carry those? No, we had a six, well, in that case, a six-man team. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the team, some of the teams began carrying the, uh, M60 a little later, uh-huh. and then uh, the RPG. 
because they cut the barrel off and it had the um, the magazine, the, the uh, circular um, magazine that holds, I think it's 200, 250 rounds. Got it. But they would, some of them did it. But in our case, because we carried the M79 also, the uh-huh. sawed off M79, because uh-huh. that gave you a lot of extra firepower. Did the, you use uh, the flechette rounds with that or just the, just the, the HE? The first round would be flechette. Uh-huh. So if anything was close, that would be the first round. And then if we needed the HE, we had the HE rounds. But no AWs, man. That's it. This I, I, when I hear that story right there, I would do anything to have an M60 machine gun in oh, that yeah. situation. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just the weight, the rounds, and everything else. You know, and like in my case, I carried the radio. I always carried the radio. Yeah. And so between the radio, the battery, and we always had 600 plus rounds. We were. Um, we. I was on my first deployment to Iraq. I was on like one of my first patrols in Humvees, and we were out, and. We we ended up we hit a uh, a little I don't know what you call them a steel hedgehog Do you know what that is Yeah It's like a little obstacle right Right That Americans had put out Americans had put out a steel hedgehog a little It's like a little obstacle for those of you who don't know It's to prevent cars from going by yeah. Well we were we we made a wrong turn somewhere and we went down a road we weren't supposed to go to and we hit uh, one of those little steel Ooh. hedgehogs We didn't know what it was so we're driving along It's actually my Humvee too and it it made a loud noise and sparked. And I actually thought, in my mind, I thought we just got hit with a low order IED, like a low order booby, booby trap that didn't fully explode. So we come to a stop and we all get out of the vehicles and now we're in the middle of Baghdad and then we're just surrounded by threats. And in our mind, we're about to be attacked because we didn't know that we had just ran over our, our own American <laughs> thing, but we're too yeah, stupid but still, to still, you don't know. We don't know that. So everyone's out there and we're all out there with our with our M4s, our little basically car 15s. Yeah. And you, you, like I felt, I think I felt completely naked. I was saying to myself, God, you know, like we need better weapons. Now we had 50 cals mounted in the Humvees, but you know, once we were mobile, I'm thinking we do, why don't we have, why don't we have, you know, belt fed machine guns. When I got, when we got back that night, it wasn't just me that felt like cause that, because that night, all my guys, they went in every Humvee, everyone put belt fed machine guns, we mounted them, we staged them. <laughs> so anytime we got out of those vehicles, we, yeah. we were ready to go to war. Oh yeah. Yeah. Particularly in a situation like that, because you can have unlimited people come oh, after you out of the buildings. nuts. But yet uh, that naked feeling, yeah, because an AW in a situation like this, oof, that'd be <laughs> nice. Going back to the book, for more than an hour, my cries and screams into the radio and the URC-10 beeper went unanswered as the NVA mounted more attacks. There was no need for radio secure procedures now. The hide-and-seek portion of the game was over. Now it was simply a matter of survival. My respect for the NVA's tenacity grew that day, but the hill, the jungle, and our car 15s worked against them as they continued to pile up or drag away more bodies. With no help around, conserving ammo while keeping the enemy back became a top priority. There were no more full automatic blasts from us. Although we had been in contact less than two hours, it felt like we'd been fighting for several. As the team anxiously awaited for help from above, the few team members pitted against the enemy NVA seemed ludicrous in terms of survival. The enormity of the jungle hit home. Yeah, so you got, how many rounds did you say you would bring? Well, you always carried 600 plus. Per man. Oh uh, no, the Vietnamese would carry a lighter load because they okay. could. Yeah, they only were like ninety-eight pounds. Uh huh. So I forget what their load was. And you guys had twenty-round magazines at this point, right? Correct. No, thirty were just a dream we thought about. <laughs> and a couple guys were smart enough to to write the Colt, order them, and they had to mail to them later. Oh yeah. We weren't that smart, so we had the <laughs> twenty rounds, but because of the spring, you only put eighteen in. Yeah. Oof. And so you're taking at this at some point probably. How long into this are you starting to take point shots instead of? Oh yeah, like, you just wait until things come out, you see it, and then just one or two. <sighs> Finally, I heard the Texas drawl of Spider on the radio. An F-4 Phantom jet returning from a bombing run in northern Laos had heard the beeper and called him. I told Spider we had a prairie fire, prairie fire emergency. Spider said that he had also called the judge and the executioner. Who were the judge and the executioner? <laughs> <laughs> they were uh, pilots for the 176 out of AmeriCal Division, and they were the muskets. Okay. And uh, they had been assigned permanently to CNC earlier in the year, and they'd been up to Camp Duck, and then um, they'd been assigned, and when Camp Duck was closed down, 
they came to Fubai and they actually built a barracks that the helicopter pods could stay in. They were one of the crews, mm-hmm. them and the Marine Corps, a uh, Scarface. Uh, were gunships that, that regularly hung out with us and yeah. saved our bacon. So, um, the the judge, he had, they had these old gunships that could barely get off the ground, but he had the rocket pods, and then uh, the executioner was a cook, and he had the uh, minigun. Those are some awesome call signs. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the book, thankfully we had made mirror contact with Spider earlier and he was able to pinpoint our location in a matter of minutes. Soon Spider was over us. He told me to pop smoke. Our SOP was not to say what color smoke grenade we would use, assuming the NVA were monitoring our FM frequency. I popped yellow smoke. He said he saw two yellows, which meant the NVA were monitoring our frequency and had guessed which color we would use. We changed frequencies and I popped a violet smoke. A few minutes later, the first A-1E Sky Raider arrived on target and made a gun run on our eastern perimeter. His wingman made the first napalm run on the south side. Put your heads down, I'm gonna make you sweat, he said. He brought it so close we could feel the heat from the deadly jelly. A few seconds later, we smelled burning flesh. He dived toward us a third time. The pilot drawed its crispy critter time. <laughs> The napalm run was so close we could feel the air being sucked away from us by the exploding material. If the jelly had landed on a person's skin, it would continue to burn either until it burned itself out or was deprived of air by mud or some other substance. The SPAD's arrival changed the tempo of the firefight. When the NVA heard the old World War II plane making another run, they charged us in in a desperate attempt to get as close as they could in order to avoid the Sky Raiders' deadly ordnance. The NVA were getting close to the belt. That's horrifying. So for those that don't understand the tactics of that situation, you got aircraft overhead, they're dropping napalm, so what do the, you think, oh cool, that'll make the NVA run away. No, No. actually what they wanna do is get close enough to Americans that they can't get napalm dropped on them. By 68, they had the tactic down really tight. They knew when the aircraft were there that they were safer to closer to us, and then so they get closer, hopefully to wipe us out and to save their own ass. That's like there's I guess there's no higher motivation than napalm coming at you if you oh, stay where you're at. Nasty. <sighs> and so therefore, even at that stage of the game, we had to go back to full automatic a couple times. Because they're charging hard. Oh yeah. What numbers are we talking about? No, never knew. We just stacked them up so high. We never had you know no time to go do a body count. You know how that is. Yeah. You're just busy killing them. Yeah. I don't want to throw that out this all nonchalant like yeah, I know how that is. No, actually we never stacked up bodies so high that we lost count. <laughs> uh Going back to the book, then an Air Force pilot and an F-4 Phantom arrived on station. Tell your people the ordinance will arrive on target before you hear me or the rounds, the pilot said. I told the team to put their heads down. The phenomenon of, of having bullets tearing into a target before anyone could hear the aircraft which delivered them was unbelievable. The jungle in front of us was shredded by the F-4's gun run. Within a minute or two, his wingman dropped two 500-pound bombs. The change in aircraft staggered the NVA for a few moments. Right then and there, I thank the Lord for Uncle Sam's Air Force. The judge and the executioner rolled in right behind the fast mover. The judge's minigun was real close to our perimeter. Seconds later, the executioner followed behind him, firing several 2.75 millimeter rockets while his door gunners blasted away with their M60 machine guns. Because we hadn't expended any ordnance to our west, we ran the gunships over the western edge of our perimeter. They drew no enemy fire either. About a half an hour before dusk, Spider told us the King Bees were on their way. By that time, the judge and the executioner had refueled, reloaded, and were returning a few minutes in front of them. Everyone in ST Idaho was dangerously low on ammo, grenades, and M79 rounds. So now you got the the extract platforms are coming back, the king bees are coming to get you. Before the king bees moved in an attempt to pick us up, Spider had the judge and the executioner make gun runs so close to our perimeter that we could hear the expended shell casings from the gunships M60 and miniguns falling to earth. Through all of the excitement, I told Walken that Spider had spotted an area west of our perimeter where a king bee might be able to settle into some elephant grass for us. Walken and, and, and Hip passed the word to the team and we started moving toward the area. From our location, we couldn't see the elephant grass and I had assumed we were locked 
into double or triple canopy jungle. Again, the judge and executioner hammered our eastern flank as we moved toward the tentative LZ. So I got, ex- or I, if you could explain Spider's position a little bit, because oh. that's pretty, I think that's pretty unique to Vietnam of how those guys could be up overhead sort of watching and, and directing. Yeah, they're, um, we called them Covey, the code name was Covey, C-O-V-E-Y, mm-hmm. but they were the forward air controllers, basically. And in, in the C&C mission, um, you have an Air Force pilot. At that time, most of the uh, Cubbies were O2s, Cessna O2. They had a push-pull double engine. and um, But they always would have uh, a prior 1-0, somebody with experience who had been on the ground who would be with the Air Force pilot. So the pilot would fly. Then he would turn the radios over so to Spider or whoever the Cubby rider was. Mm-hmm. So that was a, a, a slot. So sometimes the guys would be wounded, they couldn't go to the field, but they could fly Covey. Got it. So that when we're on the ground, we have a situation that we're dealing with, then he's able to understand it as opposed to talking to an Air Force pilot right. who's just used to getting a bomb and drop it somewhere and talk about all the contingent liabilities that spin off of a firefight. And so that was uh, Spider's job. He was the Covey rider. And then he and Pat Watkins that day were the two Cubby riders that came in, and they covered us until they got us out. Man. Uh, going back to the book, Sal and Hip were covered our frantic, desperate drive to the chopper. After taking 10 minutes to cover those last 10 yards, we reached the hovering King Bee, which is about eight feet above the ground. Fuck set up an impromptu security watch on the western side of the rotor wash. A quick check of my ammunition revealed I was down to one frag grenade, one white phosphorus grenade, and two magazines of CAR-15 rounds. If I didn't get extracted, that last frag grenade would be mine. There was no way in hell I was going to be a POW, especially after all the NVA, ST Idaho, and TAC Air had killed. If I had to use it, I'd take as many NVA with me as I could. That's a bold statement. Oh yeah, but that, I just uh, by that time we knew about POWs, what they'd mm-hmm. gone through, and um, we had lost a couple of guys, and one of them had escaped. And they were, you know, we're, by now we're hearing the POW stories. Right. So it's bad enough in country, but for our mission, no, nah, wasn't going to happen. I figured if this is it, I'm just try to take as many as we can, make it a final. Contact. <laughs> Check. Now, you guys eventually get to where you're loading the the King Bees, which again, these are Vietnamese pilots. They're old aircraft. Right. Probably look like they were held together with, you know, <laughs> duct tape. And <laughs> well, they always had oil and fluids inside. Yeah. And sometimes if you sat in too deep, you get the fluid on your head. <laughs> but uh, we liked them better than the Yui. Because they could take they could take more hits, uh-huh. and they had those old B seventeen engines up front, the nine rotary heads, <clears throat> and uh, they could take more hits. That's why we liked them. And this uh, Captain Thin is that how you say it? Thin Captain Tin. Tin. At some point during the craziness, I looked up at the pilot of the King B, Captain Tin. He was above all the madness on the ground, completely calm and collected while his aircraft took numerous hits from enemy rounds. What made his demeanor all the more extraordinary was how it contrasted with our adrenaline hyped frantic behavior on the ground. We had been fighting for hours. We were dirty, we were sweaty, and we were exhausted. And there sat Captain Tin, cool as a Rocky Mountain breeze, giving the impression that it was just another milk run. It was as though he said, no sweat, boys. I got all day. You just take your time. (laughs) The stewardesses will break out the beverages after you've secured your seats. (laughs) Looking at Captain Tin for a brief moment generated a mental image I'd carried with me forever. Frankly, I never understood how one man could be so steady under so much enemy fire and keep the chopper hovering. Can you imagine? To this day, I can't. Yeah, and you go into a little bit further here. A day or two after the extraction, Captain Tin and his crew came into FOB1's Green Beret Lounge. I went in and thanked him again and ordered a couple rounds of drink for all the King B pilots and crew members. 
speaking through an interpreter, Captain Tin said the King Bee he flew to extract us from Echo 4 had 48 holes in it from en- en- enemy ordnance. Sitting at the bar, Captain Tin appeared to be just as cool and above the fray of daily life as he had on 7 October. Tin said that an enemy round had torn a baseball-sized hole through one of the rotor blades. I asked him how he could hover so long. He told me that when he piloted a helicopter, he thought only about flying, nothing else. No enemy bullets, weather, or anything. Only flying. If it's my turn to die, I die. That day wasn't my turn to die. Amazing man. He's uh, He lives in Arizona today. Really? He's still alive, yeah. Oh. He, We'll be having him on the podcast. Hopefully, he wants to come on here. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and then you had one of your guys, and this is a this is like the other end of the spectrum. Like it's hard to maintain. One of your guys, Davidson, had to talk to you, and he came up and he said, "Tilt." And I haven't mentioned that your nickname was Tilt yet. Correct. Where'd you get that nickname? Pinballs. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you play a pinball machine. You lose and walk away pissed off. When I lose, I shake the shit out of it. <laughs> get to see my nickname in neon. <laughs> then I leave. <laughs> How did the SF guys know about that? How'd they learn about it from? Oh, it goes way back. Yeah, I was a kid. We used to yeah. play pinballs all the time. Little anger management issues. Oh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Davidson, he comes up. Tilt, I have to tell you something, brother. I don't think I can do this. I survived DAC 2 brother but i ain't seen i ain't never seen shit like that before in my life we were really lucky to survive that mission i don't think i can go on i hate to desert you brother but i think i want off the team now i understood that look on his face from the previous day i told davidson that i respected his decision and that i appreciate his frankness i thought it took more courage to be honest in camp than to not say anything and go in the field a man unsure in the field could get other team members hurt. He re- I reiterated that he had performed well under fire in Echo 4. He hadn't run. He hadn't quit. And he had demonstrated exemplary courage during the entire mission. As we walked and talked, I put my hand on his shoulder. James, you and I and Walken did something few men in America will ever do. We survived Echo 4 and all the NVA could throw at us. There were six of us against hundreds of North Vietnamese finest. We will have, we will always have a special bond, something no one can ever take away from us. Thanks again for your honesty. I asked him if he wanted me to talk to the Sergeant Major or did he want to do it? Because he had only been in camp a short while, he asked me if I wouldn't mind speaking to the Sergeant Major first. I agreed and asked him what sort of assignment he preferred. I don't know, brother. I'll need some time to get my head straight. And you have a note in here, 32 32 years later, I I talked to James Davidson in New Orleans on the telephone. One of the things he said was, brother, I've never been the same since those two days in Laos. Oh yeah. And getting back to Captain Tin for a moment, uh, after he pulled us out and we landed at Fubai, I'd climb up and thank him and say, come on and I'll get you a drink. He goes, no, my family's waiting for me. They're holding dinner. Mm. <laughs> no, and even on that extraction that night, because it was right at sunset, mm-hmm. and so when we pulled out, it's one of those beautiful scenes where it's a dark green, evergreen mm-hmm. of the jungle, mm-hmm. and all these little sparkling lights that are red with the green tracers coming up. If it hadn't been traced, it was just a beautiful scene, but then you realize, hey, that's the NVA still trying to shoot our dumb ass down. <laughs> and it was, but then we flew... He headed south directly for a few minutes. We had the sunset. It was that sweet sunset. Mm-hmm. And it was at that point that Sal looked at me and gave me that look. That's all it was. So we, we cut the mustard. So, he, you know, because when I first got into camp, he looked at me when I came in, when the spider introduced me. <laughs> and he goes, He's too tall, his feet are too big, and he looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it took me five months to get to get on his good side, but we finally got there in Echo 4. <laughs> that all you had to do was just fend off uh, a few hundred NVA. Together. Yeah. yeah, that's all it took. And and so Davidson, so this was a volunteer <clears throat> to get into the program, and you could at any point and say, hey, Anytime you I'm could done. quit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
and no dishonor to it. Yeah. We always preferred because like with Lynn Black in uh, in Chapter 6, when they came up against 10,000, one of his Americans, who was the son of a general who was just there to try to get some medals for himself, mm-hmm. um, never fired one round in anger and prayed during the entire day with his face in the ground. Mm-hmm. The Vietnamese were ready to kill him. So that's the kind of thing that you don't want. No, no, that's, that's horrible. <sighs> yeah, these, these contacts that you're getting in, I just, it's, it's hard for me to get my head around you know, <laughs> being out there like alone like that. With with just really limited support, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, there are days, but we had Uncle Sam's Air Force, <laughs> and those door gunners were great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we had Scarface, you know, from the Marine Corps, and we had different units that were attached to us, and we we're just really lucky. Whenever we called, they always came. And in fact, the one uh, Scarface it was Lieutenant Colonel Robinson. Mm-hmm. He pulled us out several times. After he pulled us out that one time, he got his plexiglass shot out. The bird shot up. We get us back to food, but he chewed my ass. Out. Every time we come to get you, he chewed my ass out. We go into the club. He still chewed my ass out. I bought him drinks. Got him so drunk he couldn't walk. He had to fly. <laughs> <laughs> he still chewed my ass. Out. I said, Colonel, are you saying you're not going to come the next time? He said, I didn't say that. Every time you rang the bell, they yeah, came. Yeah. But oh my God. They could barely, they were try, they, the door gunners would get out of the helicopter. They were like the B or D models, those really early UEs. Uh-huh. And this is true with the muskets. The door gunners had to get out and kind of lift the helicopter as they tried to get enough power to get off the ground because they're just so loaded with ordnance. Then they jump in once they got moving. <laughs> Quite a sight. <laughs> but they always came. <laughs> and the, the other thing is that's weird is they didn't really have nighttime capability. None. Like anyone. So, well, I, it seems like like to, nowadays, n- night is no factor for America. Oh, I know. Like, we would have run over our mother for one of those nogs. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But for you guys, once the sun went down, it was hard to get picked up. It was hard to call for fire. It seems that way. Oh, yeah. No doubt. And then, So you, uh, were racing the su- you were racing the sun. You were racing, Mother Nature yeah. always. Yeah, she's a, she's a key player between the weather and the, and the sunset. <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely. that's the other scary thing is, I mean, you, t- I, you know, this is something I, I usually say early on, but I haven't said yet. I'm reading tiny excerpts of this book. So if you're listening to the podcast, these are tiny excerpts. This is less than five, less than 3% of this book. This book is filled with this kind of mayhem. So you have to get the book to appreciate it all. <laughs> I'm just kind of hitting some of the, the highlights. But yeah, the fact that you guys were racing against the sun going down and how, oh, the sun goes down? Okay, cool, We're, what does that mean? In modern day SEAL teams for me, that means we use a night strobe, a, an, an infrared strobe that the enemy can't see instead of a marking panel. What does it mean for you? It means another another 12 hours out in the bush because you're not <laughs> getting picked up. <laughs> <laughs> and just hope that the, uh, the lions leave you alone, you know? I mean, the tigers. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had this one, Idea, or you know, your your the group had an idea of dropping like a big giant daisy cutter, <laughs> but a big yeah. bomb like a two thousand pound bomb, right? In order to, in areas that were so packed with with vegetation that you couldn't get in a helicopter in there. Say, oh, we got an idea. We'll just drop a big bomb and then let's we'll go land in there. Yeah, and get dropped off in there. And um, so this this one operation where you're doing that, you're you're heading into the jungle. You're going to one of these things where you drop a two thousand pound Daisy cutter bomb. You're repelling. You're the number one man heading down. Right. And you you decide that like, hey, this is an abort situation. I think you saw some enemy. Oh yeah. And so you decide, okay, let's abort this thing. And here we're going to the book. As I looked up, I was glad to see King, who's one of your team members, climbing back into the King B. I got on the radio and told Covey to abort the mission as we had been compromised again. For a few fleeting moments, I'd considered trying to get the team on the ground. Frankly, I was sick and tired of getting shot out of LZs and I wanted to run a mission instead of going through the gut-wrenching firefight um, on the LZs, which is, you know, again, I'm skipping around this book, but you would do mission after mission where you guys would try and land and you'd get shot off the LZ. Oh, yeah. Um, that would be the primary, secondary, and then the uh, alternate LZs. So you, you try three insertions, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, for the record, if I go one insertion and I get shot off, I'm coming home. 
<laughs> I'm coming home. We we're going to go enough. reload. We were I'm, gonna, I'm not, not going to go to the secondary. <laughs> and if I get shot off the secondary, I'm damn sure not going to the tertiary and think I'm getting away with it. I'm going to go back and come up with a new plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, by then, the king be running out of gas. He had to go back. <laughs> uh, so you're there. Then I saw the helmet of an NVA soldier heading toward the bombed area. He was approaching from the area where I heard the f- first voice from the jungle area in front of the helicopter, which was up the hill from where I was on the ground. As soon as I saw him, I opened fire with my car 15. Suddenly the King Bee swerved away, leaving me on the ground. Suddenly it was eerily quiet. Then it hit me. I was standing in the middle of a smoking LZ in the middle of Laos, and I was alone. All of a sudden I felt small, very small. The trees that had survived the bomb blast were tall. The jungle surrounding the LZ was both impressive and formidable and not somewhere I wanted to travel by myself. I tried to raise Covey on the radio. There was no answer from Watkins. Even though I was the American team leader on ST Idaho, I insisted on carrying the radio because I wanted to be the person calling airstrikes around my team. The Vietnamese kept us alive in the field and I felt my end of surviving the jungle warfare was to direct tactical airstrikes and helicopter gunships to the enemy. So the King Bee comes back, so you're there. The King Bee comes back. Captain Tuong. Drops a ro- <laughs> drops a rope down to you for you to clip into because it's, I guess, too tight for it to land or it doesn't want to land because it's going to take a bunch of time and energy. So they just throw you a rope. Yeah, they can't land because there are too many tree stumps. The uh, daisy cutter didn't cut everything down. And then at that time, we were just uh, refining the tactic of using rope extractions. So hey, for anyone that's listening right now, when you're refining tactics, try and do it on training operations. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did. We trained first. We know we had the 150 foot rope yeah. with a sandbag to it, and then it had a D ring on the end, and be a 150 foot rope. And so they had to have a sandbag so yep. we get through the jungle mm-hmm. to get to the ground to mm-hmm. you. And we hadn't developed other tactics, but you had a D ring on your chest. Well, you're going to get to that. Yeah, yeah. But so uh, yeah, here we go. I saw no <laughs> NVA, but the weapon that was being fired had the unmistakable bark of an AK-47. I fired another M79 round in that direction. That round's explosion must have startled Captain Tuong because he jerked the King B upward, yanking me off the ground before I could slip the D ring on my left shoulder around the rope. That shoulder D ring was critical for staying in the Swiss seat. We had heard horror stories about the body desecrations and the, the NVA had performed on SOG men and I didn't want that happening to me. As Tuong lifted me into the air, I opened fire with my car 15 on what appeared to be a muzzle flash coming from the hilltop area. So you're getting hoisted up by the helicopter while you're returning fire and slipping out of your D-ring. <laughs> yeah, it didn't quite get hooked in because uh, at that, as we got a little higher up, I was ricocheting off the trees. I was, I was a human pinball for a few minutes there. Tilt. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Then I became scared. So then you decide to become scared. Okay, that's fine. (laughs) I still hadn't hooked my shoulder D-ring and someone fired a few green tracers at us. Captain Tuong started to pull out of the target area. As he started gaining speed, I ricocheted off a few trees before I cleared the jungle. Having sat in the King Bee's co-pilot seat, I understood why he pulled away from the LZ before I had cleared the trees. If the chopper gets shot down, the mission turns into an operational nightmare while potentially injuring or or killing the crew and the recon team members aboard the ship. I wasn't angry with him. Hell, he came back for me. I would have been stranded down here for at least two more hours before other choppers with ropes could have been able to extract me if he hadn't but being dragged through the trees hurt. I was angry at myself for not getting the damn D-ring hooked before I lifted off the ground. My arms were getting very sore. As I went to switch arms, I was struck by some sort of air pocket and suddenly I was upside down at 5,000 feet. (laughs) My only physical link to life was the D-ring hooked into my rope seat and the 150 foot piece of rope hanging from the helicopter. I twisted my body to look up at King again. Thank God he was still hanging out the door. I signaled to get the chopper to land. As I was giving King signs, I felt the rope slipping down my thighs to my knees. At the same time, my web gear was sliding from my hips over my stomach toward my neck. In a matter of moments, the Swiss seat was at my knees. The only way I stopped it from moving further was by spreading my legs. I felt really stupid. After all the training, this was going to be a dumb way to die. As the rope slid across my feet, I knew I was moments away from passing out and there was no way I could keep my legs spread. Just before the end, several brief scenes from my life flashed through my mind. 
Dolores, my kindergarten sweetheart. Why did she move to California? I saw my dad's new 1949 Chevrolet milk truck with its dark evergreen paint with the white side panels and rich gold leaf letters. My red wagon from childhood, high school football games. And to add insult to injury, I saw the front page article in my hometown paper about my death. The story was below the fold because stories about local boys dying in Nam were now commonplace. That angered me because my family would never know where I really died. On the other hand, I didn't want them to know how I really died. (laughs) Just as I started to pass out, I felt the rope slip off my feet. My body went limp. I vaguely remember hitting the elephant grass before landing hard on my back on the ground. I had fallen only 10 or 20 feet. The ele- elephant grass cushioned the fall. I hadn't realized that Captain Tuong had the aircraft descending during those last frantic moments. <laughs> oh, yeah. Had those legs spread like a New York City hooker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a nightmare. Yeah, and King came out and picked me up and threw me in the in the chopper and left all my gear there. So my Car 15 and my Sog knife, which now would be a highly treasured item, still in Laos. Oh, you you, you lost it in Laos. Oh lost, uh, yeah, he just pulled open the web gear and I had to get the thing off my neck, the rucksack, the web gear. It all just choked me out. He pulled it off and just picked me up. And threw me in the helicopter. I never. I was really happy to feel my head bounce off that metal floor. <laughs> it hurt, but it, it's a happy hurt. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Again, if you have to get this book, because that's I'm I'm trying to pick like some good stories, but th- these are just the kind of ridiculous uh, <laughs> things that that are going on. Just another day in Sog. Just another day in Sog. Yeah. Getting hung upside down, five thousand feet above enemy territory, by a D ring. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> another one here you guys got some bad weather you are got no support overhead that's another thing people need to understand is when you, because of where you guys were located at a pretty good distance away from the bases if there was no aircraft overhead then you wouldn't be able to communicate with anyone because they, you'd lose line of sight. Now, did you guys carry ever carry HF radios to try and make long distance? We had VHF or UHF. Yeah, the yeah. Eric Ten was that. And but um, at nights during the day, there was a there was always an airborne command mm-hmm. aircraft up. Mm-hmm. So at the daytime was Hillsboro code. At night it was Moonbeam. So they would check in with us on our frequency. So you would, no matter what, you'd have some right. level of comps. Okay, that's good to hear. And so because of the, uh, we knew the NVA uh, RDF radial direction finder was really good. They were they were sharp on that. So when they would check in with us again, it would be just a click, click, mm-hmm. no discussion. And for, for those of you that don't know, the that's direct radio direction finding. So if you sit there and talk on the radio for a long period of time, the enemy can actually capture those, those Transmissions they triangulate and they use multiple stations and they can tell what direction they're coming from and they can triangulate where you're at and they can come and get you So for this particular one you guys are the weather's bad So you don't have any you, you don't have any actual direct support overhead The the NVA had been chased the war This is the one where you got you try to set up an ambush and they told you don't do it Well, no, we had the ambush set up we'd been yeah. in it, but then they told you don't execute the ambush right yeah, don't execute it because we were had visions of we get the POW, because in that day, if you, we captured a live POW, five-day R&R, anywhere in the world, $100 bonus. I was like, <laughs> man, we're talking about it. We're just planking plans, Hawaii or Australia. We hadn't quite decided. And then Spider came back over, and I gave him the code. We got a POW. We'll be back at the primary LZ in one hour. And that's what he said. Don't move. Yeah, but you hadn't initiated. You didn't have the POW no. yet. You were waiting. Oh, yeah, they were walking up and down a trail. It yeah. was, it was, so it was um, just a matter of time before you were going to well, spring your ambush. And this is one of those deals where we violated all the rules of recon. Normally, we go 10 and 10. Walk 10 minutes, pause 10 to hear the jungle, let the jungle see how it's gone. Well, in this one, because we had so much trouble trying to get in, they had uh, slash and burn areas that were underneath the jungle canopy, I divided the team. We had an eight-man team this time. Put four on each side, and I said, we're going to go up this hill until we get to an area, to a trail or whatever. And we didn't stop. We went really hard, maybe 20, 30, 40 minutes. I forget now. 
we came up to this big trail. We crossed it one at a time, covered our tracks, got things set up. Sal put up the wiretap, had a perfect ambush. You know, we had trained. Uh, Lynn Black had developed the uh, the uh, ambush kill zone so that we'd have claymores that would go across, but in the center there would be a six-foot area that there'd be no shrapnel. But we had – he he practiced on himself with C4. <laughs> so he finally figured out at this certain length what a stick of C4 was where you knock yourself out. But he did, literally. Yeah. <laughs> I know this is another entertaining oh, yeah. thing. So well, anyway, right. that's our ambush. It's in the book, yeah. But we had it all set up. So we had the C4 to knock out one person, claymores to kill everybody else with sides, perimeters, and one in the rear just in case they came down the mountain on us. And they're diddy bopping up and down the trail. We could we could have had officers. They're walking down the trail. Nobody's that upset because we had gone so far, so fast, violating all of our rules that the people up the hill didn't know what was going on down the hill. And then Spider says, don't move. And it's like, that's when things got really ugly. <laughs> and and when he, what, what was the reason why he told you guys don't do it? Because the weather was moving in? Oh, yeah. You know, you, they you inserted, we had only been right. on the ground two or three hours. And the weather socked in. He's at 10,000 feet. I can't even see the mountain, let alone see an LZ. So he's saying, look, we're not going to be able to get you out of there right now. Just don't do whatever you're going to do and, and, and oh, yeah. break contact, get away. Yeah. So you guys are kind of kind of on the run. You guys start moving out of there. Right. And, and so about that time up the hill, we hear the tanks and other trucks starting up their engines. And all of a sudden, the activity on the trail goes from casual to frantic. Now everybody's <laughs> two or three guys. They all got their AKs. What do you think clued them in that, that you were there? Well, they heard us come in. Uh, and by okay. then, we could hear the dogs. They had some dogs that were back on the LZ. So they had started looking for us officially. <laughs> so when you hear dogs, tanks, trucks mm. and a bunch of people with AK-47s? Yeah. How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, the pucker factor is minus zero. God. It really is. It's like, oh my God. And you know that you've got no form of extraction. Correct. The weird thing is, I guess, and, and having worked in the jungle a little bit, you know, I've, I spent some time in the jungle in South America and then Southeast Asia, like I will say this, the jungle's huge, right? Oh, yeah. And you could see where okay, I can get I can make myself scarce at least. Oh yeah. Until you remember they got trackers, right? And they got dogs. Lots of them. So you're in that situation here. Yeah. <laughs> Another Thursday night. For but we John. did get the we did get the wiretap though. Sal had run the wiretap now, for once, over an hour. So once you want you guys had to take the tape recorder with you though, right? Oh yeah, we carried the little um you know, you think about a traditional early old mm -hmm. cassette recorder. So it had like two or four of the trip of a, a D batteries in it. Mm -hmm. And then we had the um, microphone that had a little plugging in and then Sal would run up the tree or fly up the telephone pole. Mm -hmm. In this case, he'd gone up when he came back down and put mud on the whole thing. So anybody going by on the trail looked at the pole, they wouldn't see it. Mm -hmm. And um, so we ran it for over an hour. We had run that wiretap and it flipped the cassette over because that was state of the art at the time. Yeah. Cassettes. <laughs> <laughs> all we right, did that, so, so guys, that's where we were. So you so break now that stuff like, down. Now you down, guys are moving. Pull back all the claymores, the C4. Which direction did you head? Um, did you go away from where you inserted or did you go back to where you inserted? Um, we went, no, we went away from it. Um, if I'm facing the LZ, we went to our left. Got it. And we went. We had to go re across that big trail again, but this time we had to cross it in between enemy coming up and down. The truck went past us, <laughs> and uh, so it took us a while to get back across the big trail. Because this trail, again, this is Laos. Yeah. By the way, this Spider, is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Ho Chi Minh Trail. <laughs> Spiders that I mean, even when he could see the jungle, he couldn't see that road, and the road was big enough you could drive tanks down it side by side. It's huge. It would be the equivalent of. Uh, Highway 78 okay, or 52, yeah, yeah. two lanes. So tanks side by side. But it's completely covered by, covered by the... Covered by the vegetation. So it took wow. us a while to get across the road. Then we went to the left. Then we finally came to a little stream bed and went up that stream bed because now it's dark. But now we hear more dogs, the activity on the trail, another couple of trucks go by, and all this noise. We know they're looking. And eventually you're holed up in your 
you're, you, you stop. Right. And on, on the way up that stream, we put out pepper. We put out uh, mace. To throw off the dogs. Throw off the dogs. And we had our team go up and down these little, because it's about 10-foot tall bank. We're in this little creek or stream. Mm-hmm. It had water in it. Mm-hmm. And so we were trying to lose the dogs. We knew they were coming at night. And now it's dark. And we continued up that stream for a while. I wanted to get as far away from them as we could because Sal had climbed a tree and said, they're coming. He pointed out, he told Hep, there were hundreds of them coming with lights. They all had lanterns, and the dogs were getting closer. So we continued up that stream for another hour or two at night, doing, still going out, putting down the mace, and we finally went up to the bank on the right, set up our RON for the night, rest overnight, and I'm facing the bank, and the other seven guys are around. And so, again, we hear the dogs, the people. So we're there in the RON for maybe two or three hours. Two guys come up the, the, up the stream with a lantern, burning brightly, and they go past us. Lantern goes out, and they come back. As they come back, Hep coughs, and then they stop. And I think that's Oof. where you're going next. Well, yeah, that's here, here it is. One of the NVA in the creek started crawling up the embankment toward me. I was still facing the creek. The NVA soldier was good. He only moved when the wind stirred the trees. For a moment, my thoughts drifted to summer camp in New Hampshire years earlier when we played ca- capture the flag on those clear summer nights. My favorite trick was to use the woods to get as close to the flag as possible. Now my mind was racing 100 miles per hour and I realized I was the flag and he was closing in. He was too close for me to tell anyone on my team. The jungle that night seemed deadly quiet, except, of course, when the wind stirred. As the NVA soldier crawled closer, I remembered thinking that my heart was beating so damn loud that Ho Chi Minh could hear it in Hanoi. (laughs) I flashed back to my childhood when we used to play hide-and-go-seek on West Paul Avenue in Trenton, New Jersey. One of my favorite hiding places was behind the hedges in in Mrs. Amico's front yard. I remember worrying that Teddy Zabrowski or John Wayne Austin, or worse, Barbara Poynton would find me because they could hear my heart beating so loud. I tried to comfort myself by thinking that because I had not been running in recent hours, my heartbeat shouldn't be too loud. Yet my heart sounded like a kettle drum during Beethoven's Ninth. No matter, the NVA soldier kept moving up the embankment. I was very impressed with his stealth. I could barely hear him. Then it happened. During one windy moment, I heard movement very close to me. It was only a slight sound, but a sound nonetheless. Before the wind stopped, the NVA soldier touched the sole of my size 10 R army issue jungle boot. I heard a slight gasp of surprise from him. At that moment, I had a death grip on my car 15. I had it on single shot. A car 15 on full automatic sounds much different from the bark of an AK-47 on full automatic. If I had to shoot, it would be single shots. For a millisecond, I wondered if my left foot was far enough to the left so that when I fired it, I wouldn't shoot myself. Time stood still. My pucker factor was minus zero. After a few of the longest seconds of my life, the wind stirred, but there was no movement. He remained still. After what seemed like an eternity, the wind stirred again, and I heard the NVA move backward just slightly. He was so cool. I knew he was facing me. I wondered why I couldn't hear his heart. The jungle around us remained pitch black. That was my Twilight Zone moment. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, that's that's craziness. And you think he was? um, You think he just decided like this? This guy's probably got the drop on me, and I want to live. What do you think he decided? I, I believe so, because if there had been any other movement at all, then he would have been on the receiving end of the 5.56. Five, mm-hmm. So he, made, he, a, he, made, he yeah. made a tactical decision to live. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Because then, uh, then obviously once you started shooting, the gig, gigs up and you would have been, people right. would have been on your trail close. And had it happened, I mean, my thought was if I just did one single <clears> shot, because the muzzle flash would light up where he was. And then I was hoping just it would take no more than a second shot to finish him off. So that the jungle... They would hear gunshots, but they wouldn't wouldn't be quite sure where. Was this, and people that haven't spent time out in the woods or out in the jungle, it can get completely pitch black 
in the jungle. Is that what this was? Was this oh, yeah. just like complete? Like he's you could barely even could you see his face at all? Nothing. I mean, you it's just like knew he was there. You sit there, you could feel your hand in front of your nose when you shake, move it back and forth. You could feel the breeze from your hand, but you can't see it. Yeah. So for those of you that haven't been in this, it's when you get at nighttime, and then it's a cloudy night, and then you're in triple canopy jungle. There right. is no light. None. You can't see anything, and that's what this situation is. Absolutely. Well, luckily you, you you got out of that and then you guys continue on. Going back to the book, by nine o'clock we had located the LZ and secured it. The clear area had several feet of grass on it and the ground was at an angle because it was on the side of a mountain. Again, we heard dogs. Our tactical scenario stunk. We were in a relatively open area on a hillside with minimal cover and the NVA had the high ground. Time seemed to be our worst enemy although having limited air, air resources didn't improve our mood. Finally, the other team was extracted without taking further, ca- further casualties, and Spider was overhead taking ground fire from the north of the LZ. He told the trusty and reliable Marine Corps UH-1B gunships with the radio call sign Scarface were seconds away. As we heard the choppers approaching us, one of the toe poppers that Sal and Son had planted exploded. Exploded. So you guys were doing that too. You guys oh, would yeah. set booby traps on them, on the enemy. You'd set claymores on them. Right. Which would really piss them off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to ruin their parade. Yeah. We knew the NVA were going to be hopping mad now. That's a gentle way of putting it. <laughs> Spider was able to vector the Scarface gunship to our location quickly. There was no time for orientations. We popped smoke, and seconds later, the first Scarface chopper roared in. The jungle north of us erupted with small arms fire. The second Scarface chopper roared in so close that I could see the facial expressions on the door gunner as he blasted the area north of our LZ with his M60 machine gun. Both Scarface, both Scarface aircraft took several hits. When the Sky Raiders made their passes, they also took hits from small arm fire that sounded like AK-47s. During the second gun run, Sal blew a claymore in the face of an NVA scout. Sal then blew a second claymore and returned to the LZ, reporting more NVA troops right behind him. And you guys, this is another interesting SOP, and we would do this too, carry claymores. I didn't do that. I, let me rephrase that. We would we got trained to do this, you know, in a jungle situation. Right. You guys would make claymores with like five second and ten second fuses on them. Right. Boom. Put them down. Pull the fuse. So and you're run. G- yeah, and run. I never used one of those, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very thankful that I did not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Apparently, the combination of air assets and our 40 millimeter barrage has slowed the NVA troops long enough for the extraction ships to come to the LZ. Spider told me that the 101st Airborne Division was going to extract us. The Marine Corps gunships would make one more gun run, and for the first time, ST Idaho slicks from the 101st Airborne Division would follow right behind them and get as close to the LZ as possible. We were used to the King Bees and knew most of the pilots on a first name basis. The 101st pilots were good too, but because this was our first time with 101st Airborne Division slicks, I told Shorn King that they had to be the first people to approach the ship and that they had to alert the young door gunners that five, that five of our men were Vietnamese. That's a crazy thing to think about. Oh, absolutely. So you got the we had we had yeah. horrible results when they went, when they weren't careful. And again, you know, young door gunners for sure come to the country, and if they're not briefed properly, because uh, uh, our guys dress irregularly, they're not that they would look like NVA, but they they weren't Americans. Mm-hmm. And we've had team members that that lost Vietnamese that way. Yeah, tragically. Well, we we uh, when Roger Hayden was on, he told a story of the same thing. He had they had they had uh, Vietnamese scouts, and mm-hmm. they were doing a hammer and anvil operation with a platoon they hadn't worked with before that was new in country. And there were some mix ups on the insertion and you know, just some, oh, yeah. some mistakes that compounded. And anyways, these guys, the, the anvil portion was waiting and the first guys that came out of the tree line were their Vietnamese scouts. Uh-huh. Yeah, and they got, they got lit up. Um, you know, we were in, in, when I was in Ramadi, we, I, you know, you see like pictures of seals with like beards and all that. Oh yeah, and look at all cool. Like everyone shaved, and everyone we wore regular uniforms. What the army and what the Marine Corps wore. Why? Because that exact reason. You know, you swing around a corner and you've got a 19 year old on a 50 cal, 
and he sees some guy with a beard and a gun, there's a chance you're getting shot. Whereas an American, you know, because because the jihadists would have beards, right? And in Ramadi, we just didn't. We, everything we could do to identify ourselves as good guys, right. we did. And, and your jihadists could have everything from M16s oh, to for carbines sure. to AKs. You didn't know what they'd be carrying. Yeah, and they also wore. At least we knew our guys had AKs or SKSs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing was they wore they wore paramilitary uh, outfits. Right. You know, so they wore camis. They wore body armor sometimes. They wore helmets sometimes. So yeah, that's amazing that you guys that and also you had the you had the cognizance to say, hey, wait a second, we've never worked with these helicopters before. Get out there and tell them we got some Vietnamese folks coming their way with AK forty sevens. Yeah, they were pissed because when King went down to the first chopper, nobody else followed. And I said, you make sure you tell them, then you give me the green light, then we'll send some yeah. little people. And then Bubba and I got on the second extract. And there's two other things on that mission. Yeah. King had experimental pump M79, which he carried. It held five rounds. And we, we thought we'd try it once, mm-hmm. but he carried it for five days. Well, that whole five days we were on the ground. And so at that LZ, it worked. And imagine five M79 rounds going off to 40 millimeters. And then also one night was the night that the Russians flew over us and did a resupply. And we were begging for Moonbeam to show up to get somebody on a Russian ass. But the whole side of the mountain lit up. It was the weirdest damn thing we ever saw. So that was like a signaling device for that was signaling devices that the that the Vietnamese were using to have the Russians drop the resupply in there. They were doing resupplies to the uh, Vietnamese. What language did you speak? Uh, my foreign language is English. <laughs> <laughs> so they did pushed us th- through, and they waived the waived the language requirement because by '68 they knew we had a SF had a strong interpreter corps. Got it. Like my, like Hep. He yeah. spoke four languages. He had been educated in France, and he cracked up my English. <laughs> and he was a smart ass on top of it. <laughs> a little fucker. <laughs> but yeah. he was our little guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, going back to the book, the extraction was slick and quick. When um, as we pulled out of the automatic, L- as we pulled out of the LZ. The slick took several hits. Three of us returned full automatic fire from our car 15s. I threw a white phosphorus grenade as the area north of the LZ lit up with dozens of muzzle flashes from AK-47s and SKSs. The green tracers from the AK-47s appeared as though they were coming between my legs. I was told later that as our slick pulled out of the LZ, the Scarface gunship laid down a full fuselage fuselage of, of suppressing fire. The lead Marine aircraft piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Robinson had the plexiglass windshield blown out of the aircraft. In addition, his chopper in the second gunship had taken more than a dozen hits. And yeah, and that's that's the, that's that's the uh, yeah, that's Colonel that you were saying he yeah. was he was riding you and riding you and oh, finally yeah. the way you tell it in the book, <laughs> Colonel. Does this mean the next time we're in trouble you, we, and we call for Scarface, you won't respond to the bell? Hell no, Robinson responded. I never said that. It just pisses me off when my aircraft gets shot up. <laughs> Parts are hard, hard to come by, and I'd rather be flying. Fearless. And, you know, you continue on here. I went back to my room. So this is after that crazy operation. You yeah. barely make it out for the hundredth time that you, you, you dance in death's face. I, I went back to my room and picked up a news magazine with a picture on the front page about the biggest, latest anti-war protests stateside. Insane. Whose side were they on? They hadn't seen Charlie like St. Idaho had. They never. They never asked Sal, Hip, and other Vietnamese men on my team what they felt about the war. What a day. S3 refused to pull us out when we were ready for extraction. Then S3 questioned my integrity despite the fact that we were only minutes away from fighting NVA in close quarters. Battle had not Scarface, the AE-1Es, and the 101st Airborne Slicks defended us from the sky. And there are people back in the States protesting this war. I shook my head, dropped my rucksack and web gear, picked up a small ammo belt holding several magazines of 5.56 ammo, and went to the S3 to get a Jeep. The dentist was only a short drive up the road, but I kept my trusty car 15 nearby anyway. I went to the dentist, got my tooth pulled, and drew new rations and PRC-25 batteries. And the, the reason I read all that is to read this line right here. The next day, the next day, ST Idaho got shot out of five LZs. 
Yeah, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And by that time, when we got inserted on that mission there, uh, we had gone a couple days of the same thing in the morning, get shot out. And on one of those missions, on the primary LZ, when the King B was going in, mm-hmm. Sal saw a wire across the LZ. Now, how does Sal even see a wire in a helicopter when we're going in? He saw it. He told the door gunner. Fortunately, the Vietnamese thing was quick, and they were able to swerve away. And the A-1 came in and hit that. It was a 500-pound bomb. They knew we were coming, and we had been compromised. We never realized how seriously we had been compromised. And that was proof, hard mm-hmm. proof. And we, our guys are so tired, I switched a lot of the Vietnamese around. You, so your, your guys were, some of your Vietnamese were getting burned out? Oh, sure. Because, you know, you, you do that long flight, go out to the LZ, then you go in and get shot out, shot out, shot out, fly back, get lunch, get a new target. Sometimes they just say, here's your next target. Cubby would know where it would be. We wouldn't even have any kind of background or anything on it. Just they wanted to get a team on the ground. Go back, and then we did it again. Bam, bam, bam. And sometimes would you, and so you're feeding me sometimes to say, all right, I had enough of this. Who's your main, who's your main Sal other was guy? A, Sal was my counterpart. He was the assistant team leader. He was the Vietnamese team leader. And Who he, was the other American that would be with you? Uh, at that point in time was Bubba John Shore. He came on the team in uh, November when I became the one zero at the end of October. And these guys were all freaked out too because you were like young. Oh yeah. And what were you, uh, what was your rank at that time? <laughs> <laughs> well, by then I've been promoted to an E4 because <laughs> I remember I landed. Back promoted, yeah. yeah. I'm an E Deuce in camp with a bill for E8 or E9 on the recon team. So Spider promptly got me promoted back to PFC. He said, "Now roll up your sleeves so people think you're a sergeant. We don't want them knowing you're just a dumbass PFC." <laughs> and so then by October, um, we were able to um, I was spec four, and then. Uh, when Jim wanted off the team, which we respected, and to this day I respect him, never I'll never say a word against him on that. Um, then Bubba came on, so in November that's when Bubba uh, he was the uh, one one, and then on that one mission King came along. I just felt funny about it. I wanted a little extra firepower, and he mm-hmm. wanted to try that uh, that pump M seventy nine. Yeah, why not just go on a, on a mission to test out that thing? Yeah. <laughs> 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 we had that. Uh, they sent us some thermobaric grenades for the M seventy nine. Ooh, and, um, really? Yeah, and and then they called a week later and said, "Hey, did you guys get a chance?" It was actually Leif. I think Leif dumped a, a, like an entire loadout of them on one operation. And anyways, <laughs> they they call back. They say, "Hey, did you guys? We're wondering if you got a chance to use those thermobaric thermobaric grenades yet?" I'm like, "Yeah, we used them all. <laughs> Send more. Yeah. There's the feedback." <laughs> Do not wait. <laughs> oh, yeah, and also, as a, speaking of that, as, as one of our side missions, we always carried Eldest Son or Italian Green, mm-hmm. which would be enemy ordnance, doctor to explode in their face. Mm-hmm. So when we would go along a trail, like with that big trail, we crossed it, we'd go down and dump a little of the ammo. So if anybody would see the ammo, they'd pick it up. And then if we ever came across a cache, which only happened a few times, we would put the bad ammo in their cache. So they'd use it for psyops, then it would blow up in their face. Yeah, it was a good psyops thing when they, well, there was there was another mission where you talk about where they killed the Americans, but they let the, they oh, let yeah. the Vietnamese go. That yep. was their- January 1st, 69. All right, speaking of holiday season, here's Christmas day, 1968. <laughs> You're inserted into like some really tall elephant grass. There's NVA around you. Going back to the book, due to the elephant grass, both in terms of the noise we were making and how muffled how it muffled our other sounds, we couldn't tell exactly how many NVA were moving or if they were even NVA. Black said, I smell smoke. Either our hand grenades or the NVA have started fires. Things are really heating up on the LZ, literally. I radioed Spider. I told him we were surrounded and had fires on two sides of our perimeter. I told him that if the King Bees didn't get in here ASAP, ST Idaho would be engaged in fighting fires as well as firefights. 
were you really making these punny jokes in, in the middle of these situations? <laughs> Sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're starting more fires, Bubba said. By now, the noise from the fire forced us to raise our voices when we were talking to each other. The smoke was getting thicker. I began to sweat. We threw a few more hand grenades down the hill to force the NVA to keep their heads down. The southern fire, so just so everyone understands, this is what's actually happening. You're in elephant grass, dry elephant grass, and it's burning on multiple sides of your position. Which is 12 to 15 feet tall, the elephant grass. So your visibility is like five feet, three feet? Yeah, minimal. And it's filled with smoke. Yeah. And getting worse or We wish you a Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> the southern fire's intensity grew by the second and continued to move up the slope towards us and around to the east. There was fire or fires to the north and northeast, but they weren't heading toward ST Idaho with the speed of the southern flames. By now the smoke was so thick I had my green cravat over my face and pulled up over my nose. Burning embers from the south kicked up and flew over our small jagged perimeter, dumping ashes, soot, and small burning sparks on the elephant grass and on us. Only Hip and Tuan wore hats. Several of us soaked our hair. Black told me that the NVA weren't far behind the flames. Tuan had reported seeing images a short distance behind the flames to the south and southeast. Captain Tuang knew exactly where we were as he brought the H-34 down the canyon toward us. Seconds became hours. My vision was clearer than ever, and I was acutely aware of the smoke, fire, popping sounds, and enemy gunfire. I stood on the western edge of the perimeter, waving a colored panel skyward, trying to catch the pilot's eye. The H-34 continued its slow motion descent. All I saw was the bottom of the chopper with the front of the struts sticking out to the right and left, coming down like a giant praying mantis. The rotor wash from the King Bee began to hit us. Finally, the chopper's nose turned slightly to the left and I could see Captain Tuong. Seeing his face, seeing him sitting in there so calmly in the pilot seat made my confidence surge. We would survive. And then you guys, you guys, you know, get, get around get it under control, well, under control as you can, and you start boarding the chopper. Chopper, as the last man boarded the chopper, I signaled to the door gunner to exit the area. As I sat in the door, I sat in the door as Tuang lifted the King Bee straight up for several feet before heading south. As we pulled away from the knoll, fire swept up the hill and engulfed the area where we had been standing moments earlier. Oh yeah. Every Christmas I pause. Captain Tuong roared down the canyon. We had chugged only a short while ago. I radioed Spider and gave him a team okay. Once again, ST Idaho entered that magical post-mission moment. The adrenaline was still flowing. We had survived another target. Every breath of air was sweeter. There was no thought of Christmas, mom, or holiday presents. Our gift was to be alive. That Christmas 1968 would haunt me sporadically for more than 25 years. After a while, I was able to stop sitting upright, sweating with fear when the nightmares hit. It's been almost 10 years since I had that dream, but every Christmas, nightmares or not, I always take a moment to think of Captain Tuong's courage. No sweat. King bees never rest. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh this is that's that's just a crazy situation. Oh yeah. Close and then this is like on Thanksgiving was when we had the mission down south where our six man recon team yeah. the colonel tells us you have to find three missing NVA divisions. The first, the third, and the seventh. We found them. Mm. How'd that work out for you? Uh, it was pretty intense. We used a, we used more than one of those five second fuses to hold them back. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, no, they that, just that yeah. again. That's that's why you need to buy this book and read this book if you want to hear about the eight man spike team versus a, a division. On that day, it was three three divisions. <laughs> For those of you that don't Who's know what counting? that means, that's that's thirty thirty thousand men roughly. And yeah, that's where those those um, five second fuses those five second fuses. Just so everybody understands what that means. You're trying to escape the enemy. You have a little thing called a Claymore Mine. It's like the size of a book, maybe a little bit bigger. 
and it's got a bunch of ball bearings on one side. That 550. Are 550 ball bearings on one side that are that spray out when when this thing explodes and those are so they wound people. How many of those things did you guys carry? Um every everybody had one on the team and then the one one would always carry two or three. So you guys have long as C four. Yeah, at least. And so what these guys would do, so you can use them for a bunch of different reasons. And one of the one of the things that you guys did a lot with them, and this is again, these are things that I was trained in when I was first got to the SEAL teams. They do okay when you set up a when you're going to sleep at night or you're going to set up a, a rest overnight position, right. you're going to put out claymores. And that way, if you get attacked in the middle of the night, boom, you can light off the claymores and you get a, can get some fire superiority or at least shock the enemy or do some damage to them. So you guys did that all the time. But then you made these little five second fuses knowing that if you're running away, you can just put this thing up, a, you know, put it in the ground real quick or put it up against a tree. Pull well, the yeah, fuse. you always want to have it up against a tree or something to take the back blast. Because even when you put it in and you got the last four seconds before it explodes, you're running, mm-hmm. you could still, you want to make sure that you got a little protection on the black blast. We used to detonate those things at a completely unsafe distance. <laughs> behind him, <laughs> oh, I, I like. I look back now and I'm thinking, what were we doing? WTF times two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like let we <laughs> we play the game. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> Are you related to Lynn Black somehow on this thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you started to tell that story a little bit. For those that you didn't catch the whole story, the story was Lynn Black was trying to figure out what it would take to knock somebody out with C4. So C4. At six feet. Yeah, C4 just explodes. There's no shrapnel in it. You can put shrapnel in it, but you yeah. don't have to. So it's just it's just a big concussion. So Lynn Black was trying to figure out how much C4 it would take so we can stun a guy, so we can grab him, so we can get a POW, so that we can get a five-day liberty anywhere in the world. Anywhere. And $100 cash. <laughs> <laughs> and so he figured, so the way he, the way he experimented with this was by doing it to himself. Yeah. Just standing around at the range and blasting himself with heavier and heavier weight until he got knocked out. And when he finally succeeded, he uh, his hearing was bad for a few days. Yeah. <laughs> his hair was all... <laughs> See, now, in the, to be honest with you, I don't know if this... In the SEAL teams, that would have been... We would have used a new guy for that. <laughs> we would have used a new guy. Like, okay, let's see if this works on you. Let's... When the... When the uh, Stun guns, the tasers first came in. Right, it wasn't fun to be a new guy because you know, we had to see how those things worked. Right, <laughs> so <laughs> we uh, we used to experiment with that. Indeed. So, um, yeah, those that story is just crazy, and you and you looking down and seeing the fire engulf the place that you just got picked out. Oh of. yeah, instantly. Sure, it's just like one of those moments in time. It was the same thing like on Thanksgiving Day. We got distracted. They were coming out of the jungle running at Port Arms. And so they would be trying to come down. So me and the door gunner would just literally stop them in the track. Like one of those cartoons you see on the TV mm-hmm. where the guy's running and stops. He gets janked. They would just push him right back in the jungle before they even fell down. And that was just, uh, yeah, you just you don't forget those things. They stick with you. The next chapter is called Happy New Year. Oh, uh, the day after Christmas, the S3 Brass asked ST Idaho to run another MA target in Laos. I respectfully declined, citing fatigue and general weariness. I didn't tell the Brass that I had a funny feeling about the target. I felt apprehensive for some reason. Back at FOB1, around 1,200 hours, someone from the Camo Shack came into the club and said a Vietnamese team member from RT Asp was on the radio talking to Spider. That was very bad news. Several of the recon team members in FOB1 headed toward the Camo Shack. Before we got there, Tony Harrell, a veteran recon man, came around the corner with some more bad news. They were hit by sappers. It doesn't look good. It appeared the Americans had been slow to react. In a matter of seconds, the sappers killed the three SF troops and chose to leave the South Vietnamese team members alive. The news about the sappers was a triple dose of bad news. First, we had three dead Green Berets. Second, reports one zeros had received for months about NVA sappers being a lethal force were now confirmed. Third, by killing only the Americans, the NVA pulled off a major psychological coup. 
by leaving the NV, that by leaving the Vietnamese team members alive, their survival would plant seeds of doubt and dissension between SF troops and our little people. And then you guys were heading north. The 101st Airborne Division choppers carried the six men south. When the choppers landed on the helicopter pad, Colonel Jack Warren had ordered every man in FOB4 out to the site. He was held in high regard by SF troops because he genuinely cared about his men. It had been said that because of his dedication to the SF mission and the men of SF, he would never advance beyond the rank of colonel. He had remained in SF too long, a career decision that the traditional army hierarchy despised and punished. ASP was from FOB4, FOB4, which Warren commanded. After the three corpses were unloaded from the helicopter, Warren gave a terse, teary-eyed speech to his captive audience. Warren warned everyone that if they were careless in the field, death was the result of that carelessness. Then he bent down, opened a body bag, and picked up a portion of a body of one of the dead Americans. He was now crying and screaming at his men to never be careless in the field. Warren was never the same after that. Neither was C and C. What what was it that changed from your perspective? Well, we um, from e- our early briefings, probably in October, we heard about the NVA sapper teams. They were highly trained, and um, they would just wear a loincloth, carry a weapon, and uh, they were really just highly trained in tracking so that when they came to the attack part, they had minimal clothing, and they knew what they were looking for. And the NVA at that point had a medal, kill American medal. So if they killed us, they got their medal and a bonus, and they would be heroes for the rest of their lives within the Communist Party. So we heard about them, <laughs> this confirmed it, and it just kicked up everybody's concern a notch. And um, that being New Year's Eve, the team had, the Americans had taken a bottle of scotch with them, so they had had a little hit of the scotch, we don't know how much, and that's what Jack Warren had gone the extra distance on, saying about being careless, we don't know. Mm-hmm. But those sappers were good. And um, that proved it, and it just gave us, in our case, you know, or, as you know, if you do your RON at night, without the NOGs, you always do your perimeter, and our people always checked. I mean, we always rotated who's be sleeping, who wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And we never, ever had a problem with that. No matter how tired you are, there'd be somebody awake just so something like that happened, somebody be there on full automatic ready to respond. A new level of terror. Yeah. And those guys were so, it's like they were just traveling super light and super slick, the sappers. Sure. You know, just could move quickly and, yeah, that's a scary. Uh, yeah, because, you know, the we knew that the NVA had all their sources set up. I mean, besides being compromised in headquarters, they also had people that alerted when the choppers left the launch site. Mm-hmm. They had border watchers so mm-hmm. that when we came in, they would report where we were heading to a higher command, and they would try to rally their troops. So we were up against that at all times. Just a question of who would be there, how many. And a lot of times, just getting on the ground was the first part, but then you hope to get into the mission. And it was just really a challenge. Speaking of a challenge, here we're going back to the book. The daily grind of running missions across the fence was wearing on me physically and mentally. As 69 dawned, I began a mental examination of life in SOG. Being in an elite unit within America's finest special operations was where I wanted to be. The adrenaline enhanced high of deadly firefights against a relentless enemy under extremely lopsided odds was intoxicating. I had never experienced such exhilaration or sheer terror. Yet there was a little voice in the back of my head which spoke of survival. 
surviving not only a vigorous enemy campaign directed against Sog members, but merely surviving the odds of going home in one piece. My mind also began the mental debate between rising to the new challenges inherent in a secret war and returning to a safer assignment. My one-year tour of duty was scheduled to end at the end of April. Under the general rules of SOG, after running targets across the fence for six months, I could request a cushy assignment. I had already spent seven months with the team. I was alive. However, thanks to Hip, Sal, Fuck, Tuan, and the other men of ST Idaho, I couldn't just walk away. And that's where you that's where you wrap up this book. Now you go into some cool um, you go into some cool uh, one more really interesting story and then you you also have a very cool thing in there about what you guys carried. And what and, we didn't carry. Yeah, and and what you didn't carry. <laughs> how much so how much longer so now it's January of 69. Yeah. You'd been there for 7 months. How much longer did you stay with the CNC teams? I'll stay right there to the end. Um, we we closed FOB 1 in January. They shipped us down to Da Nang, and that's where I picked up with the second book. And uh, um, they needed help down there. So we hit the ground, um, continued to run. Bubba asked to ta- be taken off the team. So he left, and Lynn Black came on. So it was Lynn and I <clears throat> for my last couple of months. And at the very end, they had a mission up at the Mugia Pass, which was – north of the DMZ River in Laos, which was a major channel point. And the plan was for us to go in, set up on a mountaintop, taking a lot of clay mortars, mortars, and um, calling airstrikes for two or three days on that just to raise hell with the NVA there Mm -hmm. because they never had a recon team go that far north. And um, we did an inspection which is that inspection prior to that mission, which was about April 20th, 69. And then um, we finally went up to the uh, launch site, and uh, we were up there, I guess maybe about the 24th or the 25th. I just forget the exact date mm-hmm. now. But we went up to the launch site, got on the choppers. We're getting ready to launch. The choppers take off, and they turn around and went back. And they, and that target had just had two aircraft shot down over it. They figured they just shot down a Phantom <clears throat> Jet and a Sky Raider. Choppers are going to be easy to knock out of the sky. So the sidebar to that, I'm at a reunion two years ago. One of the guys that ran <coughs> Recon says, remember those pictures you got on, the, on the, your second book on the ground there? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, what was that mission? Wasn't that something like that was a suicide mission, right? He says, well, I don't know about suicide. It was going to be high odds, but, you know, we were going in. We had... Two extra Americans. We were, we had M sixties. We got Buku bullets, hand grenades. We were gonna give it a shot. The guy goes, "Do you realize they asked me to do that?" And I told him to fuck off. <laughs> I go, "Really?" I says, "You saw us taking the pictures. You didn't tell me that." <laughs> he says, "I didn't know what your mission was." So here's a top secret operation. The recon guys, another recon man, had been given that target. Said, "Hell no." It was too far north. And he just felt that the uh, it would just be a suicide mission. Once you get in, you'd never get out other than a casket or a body bag. But there's no talking between teams much because everything is like you got a mission, you do your mission, they do theirs. So Yeah, well, uh, I already gave you a fair warning before we started this that we'll, we're probably going to have to have you come back on here because, <laughs> I mean, I, I got just uh, – I mean, this, this, these books are, they're just awesome. The, the detail that you go on to and just the experiences that you've had, which are just, it's a miracle that you're sitting here talking and able to tell us what you went through when, as far as I can tell, <laughs> there's no way in hell you should be sitting here right now. I agree. I mean, there are times when, uh, in talking to friends that have, or people that have read the book, you know, particularly on page 202 where the guy touches your boot. I mean... I've talked to people. It's just like it feels surreal even today. It's like, thank God everybody at home was praying, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. The last thing I want to read from the book is just uh, just this section right here. 
the dedication. It says, this book is dedicated to all SOG reconnaissance team members, both U.S. Special Forces and indigenous troops, as well as to every man in every air support unit, especially the King B pilots of the 219th South Vietnamese Air Force's Special Operations Squadron, who worked daily with SOG teams on the ground across the fence in America's secret war. This book is also for every man in SOG and their support units who made the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, because today as we sit here, there are still 1,589 Americans missing in action in Southeast Asia from the Vietnam War. That includes CIA, SF, regular army. In Laos alone, 50 Green Berets are amongst those MIAs. Over 140 aviation, Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, MIAs died supporting our missions here. Just how deadly it was. You guys had a over 100% casualty rate. Yeah, several of our guys had multiple Purple Hearts. Bob Howard received eight. He had been put in for 11. He, he, he was a recipient of the Medal of Honor in December of 68 for a mission out of Kantum. And, uh, yeah. The casualty rate did exceed 100. percent The uh, and I, I I didn't I couldn't find any numbers on the numbers that were actually killed, but that was a massive number percentage wise of guys in SOG that were killed. Right. Yeah. The, the numbers uh, are hard to track, and I'm, I'm working with a gal now who's a real. She's a retired master sergeant from the 101st, and she's beginning to do some research to to try to put that number together because. During the war, 3.2 million Americans served in Vietnam. That includes the 500,000 sailors that were off off the coast and your SEALs that were going up north. And um, out of that, 20,000, approximately 20,000 were SF. Out of the SF, approximately 2,000 went to SOG. Out of that, it depends on which author you talk to, there's no hard stats anywhere because SF was not as good as the SEALs at keeping records. And uh, it'd be between 500 to seven, maybe 800 Green Berets actually went across the fence with recon missions out of the 3.2 million. Those are our numbers. Yeah, amazing. Um, well, I hope you don't mind coming back here again. I'd be honored to come back. <laughs> Cause, uh, I've heard some of your stories, pal. <laughs> believe me, my stories are, are, are a big joke. I. I Converse with uh, one of uh, one of the guys that was in Ramadi with me, a guy by the name of Dave Burke. He was he was a Marine Corps Anglican guy on the ground with us, and you know uh, we always joke our, about our about what our our experiences. You know he had a friend and we we had him on the podcast who served in World War Two, Korea, and Vietnam. Really, he, he was a Purple Heart recipient in every war, in every <laughs> one of those wars, and you know uh, that's the way I feel standing here talking to you. Like uh, I'm I'm a in a totally different and much lower category of experience, but that's why it's such an honor to sit here and talk with you. Well, that's mutual. If you have any other closing thoughts to, you Well, know, the only I, thing about this book, actually, I had just wanted to mention that, that yeah. I couldn't have done it without my wife. Awesome. My dear wife, Anna. At the time, um, we had uh, four teenagers and one newborn in the house. <laughs> and so if you can imagine that turmoil, and I'm working at a fish wrapper up in North County, and so between the fish wrapper and the kids, she goes, go write the book. Awesome. She supported me all the that way. That is one thing, real quick, yeah. when you got home from, so you got out shortly thereafter, when you got done with Vietnam, is that, that's when you were done, right? You got out of the army shortly thereafter? Yeah, I went back to, to CNC uh, for a second tour, and then I got out of the army in April 25, that's what book two is about, going back. One tour wasn't enough at CNC. Well, you know what, to be all <laughs> honest with you, I came back in, uh, by the time I landed in the States, like May 1, May 2nd of 69, the anti-war movement was going on strong. Uh, there was Woodstock, our men walked on the moon, but I hated it, I hated being, and we were, and I was supposed to go to, to Fort Bragg with the regular SF, but they put us in 10th Special Forces Group, which is up in Massachusetts, and they had five companies, A, B, C, D, and E. E was a signal company which was rinky-dink. They had new lieutenants, butter bars, running this thing, and they treated it like basic camp, not SF. 
Then to top it off, they had old career sergeants that were all overweight, all an embarrassment to the beret they wore. And they came in and put me a platoon sergeant, and I'm, I'm in this environment that was not a good chemistry. Mm-hmm. So um, I heard that the MPs were coming, basically, and uh, I went down to the Pentagon. We had a woman, Billy Alexander, who handled our orders. And I was told what kind of wine and what flowers she liked. So before I went down there, I had her wine, her flowers. And then Thursday morning, I get to the Pentagon at 7 o'clock, give her the flowers and the wine, went back to sleep in the parking lot, came back at 4. She gave me the orders to Nam. I cleared on Friday. The MPs came on Monday, and I was back in my team a week later. <laughs> what were the MPs coming for? Eh, there's some bar fights, some property <laughs> destruction. They had reports of a 442, which I had at the time, uh, 442 W30. Which is what? Oh, it's an Oldsmobile. That's the oh, okay. Oh, God, I got, oh, that 442. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm cool. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a 69, which was the coolest car at the time. It would hear me talk. For sure. So the reports about that car going through the entrance gate on a sideways drift. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry, when it entered the base on the exit gate, that's what it was. The yeah. MPs weren't happy about that. They couldn't catch me. And I was able to hide within our comm equipment, but yeah. they were trying to begin to figure things out. But anyways, they were coming. Sounds so. like a good, sounds like the next podcast. That's Indeed. the warm up for the next podcast. <laughs> we'll we'll take it from there next time. Like a bad dream, I'll be back if you ask. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's awesome. These books, Across the Fence, which one do you think people should ride, read first? Across the Fence is the first. That's okay. my book about my getting involved and et cetera. And the stories of uh, other people, which by the way, we have a Green Beret medic, John Walton, who was the son of Sam Walton. You heard of a store called Walmart? Mm-hmm. Son, wow. one of the best medics there was at the time, chapter four, where a fellow Green Beret gets his leg blown off. And the, one of the Vietnamese got shot four times. John brought them all back. And Tom Cunningham's alive today and uh, has two children, thanks to John. That's awesome. These books are available on Amazon, right? Amazon. Just go to Amazon. They're available as e-books or paperbacks. The and other then one my is website is SogChronicles.com. SogChronicles.com. That's the name of volume one. That's another book. Right. And then On the Ground, The Secret War in Vietnam. That's the second book. The second book. Yeah, because in here, there are some stories I missed because of deadlines. Right. And the first story we have, the our recon team is in our worst target, Oscar 8, and the NVA come up and tap them on the shoulder and say, it's your turn for guard duty. Ooh. That's pretty close to the enemy. <sighs> All right, we will cover these books in the future. Everyone, go buy these books so you're ready. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Really, a true honor to have you on. Appreciate it. Honor to be here. And thank can't you wait to have you back. I hope you turn. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you. And with that, Mr. John Stryker Meyer has left the building. And what an honor it was to talk to him and. I can absolutely promise we're having that guy back on. <laughs> and thanks to you, John, for your for your service and your sacrifice and the sacrifices of your teammates. It is men like you that have allowed us to live the way that we live. And that is in freedom. So he has left the building and Echo, um, speaking of living, mm-hmm. living the way we should live, what do you got for us? Well, as we have been doing, talking about jujitsu first, mm-hmm. jujitsu, martial arts, uh, you know, capability is what it is. Mm-hmm. That's really what it is. You want to yeah. generalize like the whole thing into one big nugget? Capability. Just improve your capability. We want to improve our capabilities. Oh, A yes. sure way to do that not just in the martial fields, yeah. but in life, yeah. is to train some of that jujitsu. Yeah, I was talking, to, there's a, a girl named Kara who trains here. You know, I see her every once in a while, I'll see her or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, she she said basically the stuff we were saying, where she was like, I was like, but I only see her sort of in the men's class. I, I said, hey, have you tried the women's class? Because our women's class is good now, mm-hmm. developed. And then she was like, not yet, I want to, whatever. And I was like, yeah, that's, I think a lot of the times we'll, we'll offer more benefits, depending on who you are as a girl, we'll offer benefits because you can get like the moves you can kind of do 
you know, on a, on a body that's more similar to yours. Mm. So you can go through the moves a little bit like more thoroughly, I think, in a way, um, for lack of a better way of putting it. And she was like, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's true. She's like, you know what, though? I, I really like there's a lot of value here in, in the guys in the men's class. And she said straight for self-defense. For sure. And I was like, yeah. She's like, yeah, because like when you get used to guys and meanwhile, there's like. There's two guys Scrapping. rolling like hard though. Yeah. You know the kind where they're rolling and they're grunting it right in front of us, like sweating and splash. Yeah. They're splash, sweat splashing on us. And she's like, when you get with, and we kind of laugh because she like mm. motions to them. And I'm thinking like, yeah, any girl to come in and see that, or anyone even, anyone to even never participate in that. Yeah, I'm thinking I gotta do that. No way, man. I'm not ready for that. Or a lot what, of girls are not ready for that. Oh yeah, and what if you just all of a sudden, like one day, you go to the grocery store and, and you, boom, now gotcha. you gotta deal with that man that's that's tough there's a so big she, psychological gap you need to make up oh which yeah if you train jujitsu the gap no, is made up she was like i'm used to it. and she's not a big girl either she's just like a, a pretty small girl she's like yeah and she's real nice you know nice girl. she's like yeah i'm cut and, and it, i'm really used to that and i've been training for like j almost a year now mm -hmm. i'm like it's a big difference that's that's good that you can come in here as often as you do and have that mindset that's good. That's going to yeah. get you places. 100%. So we're talking about jujitsu. Oh, yeah. And then you need to start talking about the gear that is needed for oh, jujitsu. Yeah. Some of it, yes. Some it, of the gear that you need for jujitsu is a gi. Yes. If you're going to train gi jujitsu, which we recommend. Strong. Yes. Strongly recommend. Mm -hmm. We also recommend you train no gi. You train all kinds of jujitsu. Yeah. That's what you train. If you need a gi, which you do, get one from Origin Maine. Yep, Origin. So you go to OriginMain.com. This is where you can get all these things. Also, jeans, American denim. Again, we all, we all know this, but I'm going to say it again. It's all made in America. All of it. Yep. From Every this. little piece of it. The little seeds that they plant to eventually grow cotton, to eventually go into the loom, to eventually formulate, weave. Yes. Formulate both <laughs> the fabric that gets sewn and stitched <laughs> into geese, jeans, Rash guards, all this stuff, shorts, best shorts in the world too, by the way, yep. factually. Um, anyway, all of it is in Amer done in America. So boom, there's that huge deal, by the way. So yeah, American denim, has, we have some new jeans, good ones. Jogger, you know, sweatpants, sweat, athletic gear, boom, Origin Maine there. Supplements, mm -hmm. big deal. Pretty much... All the essential supplements that you're going to need as you go through this kind of hectic path. At times, the path is hectic. It should be. If yeah, kind of easy. Down. That's not the path we want to be on. Yeah, that's, that's that mean. path leads down. Yeah, it's going to be easy if it's a downhill situation because all you got to do is sit there and slide. Don't take the path down. Yeah. So yes, the supplements are joint warfare for your joints. Joint warfare is more for like if you have get abuse on your joints. You're running a lot. You, you're doing jujitsu where you're twisting a lot. And you're going every day or something like this. Or you're um, just lifting every day. Lifting every day. Oh, yeah. So basically, if you're doing physical activity. Yeah, that's kind of like hard. I mean, I guess you could break it down. Like, oh, if you're doing some weak physical activity. <laughs> then you might not need it. But I think, not that so much the joint warfare. You made a good point, though, at what? the muster. What Remember, because your knee is like kind of on the kind of on the final stages, stages of, of healing. healing yes. Yeah. And you were like, um, I was like, yeah, how's your knee or whatever? And you were like, uh, what would you say? Oh, it was good, but like uh, since I've been standing up on it for a long time. Yeah, yeah, all it day at the like, muster. Yeah, at the muster, yes. It actually swelled up again. Yes. Surprisingly. So here's the thing. It, it made me think. When I was a bouncer, I used to stand up all the time. Like for the whole thing, you're standing at the front door mm -hmm. and not the <laughs> – <laughs> bro, hey, it's hectic. The path is hectic. And the struggle was, is real. It was real, bro. And but I have dress shoes on. I don't have the the New Balance or the you know the deal. It's like dress shoes, so it's like it was hard. man. Joint warfare would have came in really Super handy. Hardcore. Well, you know, varying levels of hardcore. So get some joint warfare for yes. your joints. Get some krill oil for your joints. That's general maintenance and general maintenance of life. Yes, yes. life support. Yes, make it and then discipline and discipline go, which is sort of like um, gives you a little bit of that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Little edge mentally. Little edge. Should discipline be illegal? Negative. If you are going to confront someone in an intellectual battle, oh, yeah. is it legal for you to take discipline? Go, and they don't. Should not be illegal because it's not an illegal drug. 
Yeah. It's not even drugs. It's actually it's good an advantage, for you. though, right? Yeah, good. The lifting weights is an advantage, mm-hmm. Lift, or the results from lifting weights is an advantage. The results from eating salads that's an advantage. So, boom, same thing. But Check. discipline just tastes really good, and uh, and have that advantage over your enemy, whoever they may be. Yes. Then we got a. We also got milk, which is milk. Delicious, delicious protein. I had a milkshake last night. I had meatloaf, no potatoes. Meatloaf, carrots, milkshake. That's a good meal right there. Chocolate, dark, no, the darkness, and I put peanut butter in it. Boom, there it is. Literally my late dinner last night. I was tending. Yeah, that's the milk. And you can give it to your kids too. You can get the warrior kid milk Yeah. for your kids. Yeah. So your kids, so your kids, instead of turning out to be like an obese out of shape kid yeah. that you were like trying to, no, don't even put them on that path, put them on the milk train. Let me ask you this. When you were young, yes, and you went to whatever, this, elementary school, okay, yeah. junior high, whatever, did you bring home lunch? Sometimes. Yeah. So Not very often. Okay, so do you, as far as you can remember, did you did you have a healthy home lunch? Did you, was your, you know? No, nothing. We didn't even know what healthy was. Oh, okay. Like okay. it wasn't, that wasn't even a thing. Yes. Yeah, so right? that's, yeah. That it was, was just like, oh, what do you like to eat? Right. Peanut, and what, what do you like to eat and what's cheap? Yes. Right? Because yeah. we're going to get you, we're not getting you cold cuts. Right. Because those cost money. Guess what doesn't cost a lot of money? Bologna. Jam. <laughs> PB and jam, yeah. right? Peanut yeah. butter and jelly, yeah, yeah. go to all day that's, long yeah, on 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 white bread. Oh, white bread, that's okay. On no, white yeah. bread, and then you know what? You get the little the little uh, party mix of of potato chips, Frito Lay's, yeah. Doritos, which yeah. I never liked Doritos. I still don't like Doritos. Interesting, yeah. But then you get some of that, and then like some chocolate chips, some Chips Ahoy cookies. Yeah. You know what those are? Yes, I do. Yeah, get the sleeve, little little mini sleeve of Chips Ahoy. Yeah, that's a... And so there's nothing nutritional, right? The, the nutritional value of this launch is zero. Yeah. You had nothing. Yeah, if that was... Best yeah. case scenario, I used to get the chocolate milk it, it, from the... Peanut butter's cost, not bad. It cost five cents for a chocolate, for a white milk, mm-hmm. seven cents for a chocolate milk oh, at the my school. school lunch. Yeah, yep. yeah. Gotcha. So I used to get that. That would probably be what I actually lived off of because everything else was just was just poison in a wrapper. Basically, yeah. yeah the so that, does that answer your okay. question? Uh, well, I mean, the reason I was asking is because okay, so my family is, or my mom more than my dad, I guess. But you know, my mom took care of the home lunches in the event of us bringing a home lunch. She she's health conscious. She was like a hippie, you know. So we had like the whole wheat bread. Okay, you know the yeah. the and then you the, know what though? You're, how old are you? I will be forty two this year. Yeah, so you're like five years younger than me. Mm. There's a there's a difference there. In terms of what people were even thinking, yeah, yeah. Well, keep in mind, she everyone wasn't like that. I'm saying my yeah, mom no. was. My mom was like yeah. a hippie. She was different than everyone. And here's here's my point with that: where when we'd come to school and I'd bring home lunch, we'd get sort of teased mm-hmm. because it's like you don't get the cool snacks, the cool Frito what like Lay's, Frito Lay's and chips and cookies and like the cool chips fun Ahoy. stuff. Oh no, dipping that no. up in the milk. Negative, no, you got, we got the whole wheat sandwich with like turkey from a real turkey. With, with sprouted grains oh, on yeah. it or something. Whole wheat bread, 100%. So we're talking about the sprouted grains. Oh yeah, that's next like, level right so, there. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. Nonetheless, we got laughed at that. I didn't Mama like that. Mama Echo was coming in hard with the sprouted oh, yeah. grain with bread. The, with the health, yes. And that was making fun of you because it yes. tastes like cardboard. I don't even know because they don't know how it tastes. It's not that. It's more of a social thing. Everyone everyone knows that cookies are yum, yummy. Everyone mm. knows that like chips are delicious for snack and all this stuff. We didn't have that. We had like the snacks that they knew that weren't that good. Carrots. Tasting carrots. And, like, carrots are pretty tasty, though. I think so now, yeah. The thing that's good about carrots, if you're not eating sugar, and you eat a carrot, it tastes sweet. Yeah, it is. It's You're sweet. like, oh, this is super sweet. Oh, it tastes yeah. good. You can eat too many carrots because your body can't digest them fully if you eat too many of them. Just FYI. Okay. I've made that mistake before. <laughs> pounding bags of carrots? Yeah, or you what? eat like one of those bags of carrots, your gut is going to tell you. All right. It's going to be an issue. Good. Noted. Bro, where are you going with all this? Bro, I'm making a good point. Unless you want to talk about carrots a little bit more, I can't, we can't, but nonetheless, I'm making a point. So these kids would make fun of us because they got the, the cookies and we had like, tomatoes and sprouts mm-hmm. in our sandwiches. Yeah. But growing up, 
when you come early adulthood, adulthood, that health consciousness paid off big time, huge time. Sure. So to make the switch from non-health consciousness to health consciousness, it's like it's it can be a grind. That can be harder. Yeah, but and to just maintain the health, path. Maintain the path, and it's easy. already instilled as being yeah. a young person. So there's that. So milk. So my daughter comes home from school literally yesterday. Say they were teasing me because I had carrots. Mm-hmm. And she was she wasn't very happy about it. I That's why like, she knows jujitsu. Start choking fools out. Well, <laughs> I be I started to say that, but she was it was no time for jokes at this point because she had been like, "Are you serious or not?" I was like, mm, "You don't want to choke anyone for TV for your carrots." Mm. But this is what I said. One of the things I said, I said, "Don't worry about them teeth." There's no, first off, there's nothing funny about carrots. Like it's not. I'm not saying it's like or oh, so serious. I'm just saying what's funny about it? I don't get it kind of thing. And mm. she was like, yeah, that's kind of true. And I was like, and guess what? Carrots are good for you. Just like your lunch is good for you. And as you grow up, you're going to see the results of that. And you're going to see the results of them not eating, not healthy food. Yeah. And you're going well, you to see. You need to do better than that as a father. Why? Because you need a to better be, speech? be like, yeah, no, she needs to be like, they say, oh, what are you eating? Are you eating some, you eating some carrots? Yeah. And then she says, what are you eating there? Some type two diabetes? <laughs> You're going to die at age 32, loser. <laughs> Get out of my face before I put you to sleep. All right. I'll uh, implement, you know, that, that direction. Kidding. That's not part you of the know. way of the warrior kid code right there. Negative. No. That's we all are having fun. Yes. Fun is part of, you know, life. But I saw her wheels turning when she was like, like, yeah, you know, like I will all see the results, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, then my wife's there and she's like, yeah, look at dad, how big his muscles are, all this stuff. Right. So it kind of. Oh, so your wife is kind of like just making stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it worked. But go back to Mulk, Warrior Kid Mulk. This is what you achieved with that. One of the many things is you actually made it like kind of cool to have a healthy thing, have a healthy mm-hmm. snack. That's huh. where we're going. We're gonna sway a lot of people with these books and this this stuff. That's what's gonna happen. Bad. I mean, I see that. It. It's not, not even gonna happen. It is happening. Yeah. It's awesome to see. All right, dude, we gotta rock and roll. Come on, bro. That was an important story. Dude, I that thought. was a long. That was twelve <laughs> minutes deep. Right there. Anyway, twelve minutes deep. We're on line All right, three. We got Jocko White tea. How about that? Jocko White tea. Tell me about Get it. Get it. Drink it. Taste good. Deadlift. 8,000 pounds. Certified organic, by the way. Yep, certified organic and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it tastes delicious and it looks cool. So you're good. Sure. And we have a store. It's called Jocko Store. So you go to jockostore.com. This is where you can get. You can get rash guards. Uh-huh. You can get t shirts. Uh huh. You can get truckers' hats. And if you're, if you're not into truckers' hats, because whatever, mm-hmm. you can get. Flex fit hats. <laughs> yeah, bro. Flex fit hats, if yeah. hats are good, though. You don't get to judge hats. You don't wear hats. Well, they look Stand cool. Stand down. No. Stand I, down. I, I, Stand I, down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you want to represent the path. This is what it, it's for. It's quality stuff. It's not mm-hmm. ballpark giveaway uh, shirts, the one you never wear or you, or you use for, like, you know, wiping your hands in the kitchen or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's not that. You're not gonna wipe your hands in the kitchen with these shirts. About quality, quality, yes, quality and representation. Indeed. Um, so yeah, there's some women stuff on there. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. I'm gonna have a, two more new shirts coming out. Nice new. I, I don't want to necessarily say just shirts, but two more new items, things. Sure, coming out. So stand by for that. And also subscribe. Right. Yes. Subscribe to what the podcast. Sure. We're not talking about subscribe to a magazine because no one gets magazines anymore. Magazines are dead. Sure. Right? Uh, Are you going to buy a magazine now? Well, you going to have somebody bring a, a random bunch of papers to your house with advertisement? You're not going to do that. No one uh, does that. Good so point. You're not gonna, we're not talking about subscribing to a magazine. Mm-hmm. Subscribe to this podcast if you want to. Sure. If you get value out of it. Whatever. Sure. And don't forget about the Warrior Kid podcast. I just, I, I got hit. I got hit today. Yeah. I got hit. Kind of hard. Somebody said, is the Warrior Kid podcast dead? Ooh. And I was like, oh, that stinks. Good question. Yeah. That stinks. Warrior podcast is not dead. Mm-hmm. But the Warrior Kid podcast, I need to put more out. Right. So I need a little bit of time, which I'm making, but I need to get it done. So yes, right. Warrior Kid podcast, subscribe to that. I'll get some new ones in there. Also, irishoaksranch.com is where Aiden, Warrior Kid, up in Central Cal, has his own business. 13 years old running a business, no big deal. Mm-hmm. That's what Warrior Kids do. He makes soap from goat milk. 
so that everyone in the world can stay clean. And don't forget about YouTube. Mm -hmm. We have a YouTube channel. Did you know that? Yes, sir, I did. And it's called Jocko Podcast. And it's on YouTube. So podcast is not just a podcast, where it's audio only. Mm. On the video version, you can see us. If you want to know what John Stryker Meyer looks like, you can watch this on YouTube. This is going to yeah. get a lot of views on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Listening to John Stryker Meyer yeah. and hearing his stories. Mm. Uh, yeah. So check that out. Also, Echo Charles makes what he calls enhanced videos. Yes. Some people might call them distracting from the message. <laughs> sure. They might. <laughs> Some people like them. Mm. They have millions of views, some of your videos that you've made. Do you know that? Uh, yeah, I did. A lot of views. Well, like I said, or like you said, yeah, you can call them distractions mm -hmm. on the message, which I, I actually won't even argue with it. Thank you. But some people look at it or see it as enhanced. Oh, you, it, that's you where put you some use music the word on enhanced. there. You put it uh, enhances the message. It's kind of uh, like kind of like you know when you have a dog and you got to feed them the heartworm pills, mm -hmm. you know? Where the pills, the heartworm pills is good for them. It's good. That message is good. But sometimes you got to put it in the food, you know? Mm. So like it tastes good. It's like the message gets to deliver so in like a good way. So my message is so hard to swallow that you have to put like videos around it. Is what I'm hearing. Music around it. Yes, sometimes. Break out the cellos. Sometimes. Yeah. Check. Hey, sometimes. so that's the YouTube channel. Check them out. And then we also got Psychological Warfare, which is on iTunes, Google Play, other MP3 platforms. And if you want an alarm clock, that's me talking. Then you go to Psychological Warfare and that's what you get. And and you'll see that you can use it as an alarm clock or you can use it as an emergency as an emergency air cover. Yes. Fire support. Yeah. You're like, I'm not sure if I should work out right now. Press play. Yeah. On the on the psychological warfare track that's about not working out. Yeah. And you will get up and you will go to the gym. Yep. And I'll if you're about to eat some donuts. Yes. Or some chocolate chip cookies. Right? Sure, Chips Ahoy, whatever. Chips Ahoy. The one you said. You, you find a sleeve of random Chips Ahoy <laughs> hanging around somewhere. You know who used that term for the first time? when I, it, was, it was James Nielsen. What? James Nielsen would talk about eating a sleeve, sleeve. of Oreos. Yeah, the, Just oh yeah. getting after it. <laughs> James Nielsen, it's world's true. toughest accountant. Agree, yes. Factually. Black belt in jiu-jitsu for a long time. Oh, yeah. One of the OG American tr jiu-jitsu practitioners. Practitioners teaches on on Saturday. Saturdays here at Victory MMA and Fitness, which, by the way, is our gym in San Diego, California. If you yeah, want to train some, you know what's funny about that too? Where you know how you say, "Oh yeah, the world's toughest accountant," right? Mm -hmm. And he teaches jujitsu too. So teaching jujitsu that's a job, like that's mm -hmm. a career, like you're a jujitsu instructor. True, but he's like well, he's an accountant, but he just teaches yeah, jujitsu. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like an accountant is like some you know scraping by sort of gig. No, no, no. It's no. like that's a and there's a few people like that. You know why? Because teaching jujitsu is fun. Yeah, and it makes you better at jujitsu. Does make you better. That's just how it is, man. The nature of the game. That's on psychological warfare. Also, you can get it if you want some visual representation of the path to keep you there. You can go to flipsidecanvas.com, run by my brother Dakota Meyer. He makes art with layers with layers mm -hmm. the layers are free they well they, they're not free they come with the cost of the art right right layers included layers included yeah. there you go yes we've designed some of the items there yeah you know good. let them know like hey this would be kind of cool over here yep. and if you want something just just request to coda on twitter i think is the best place yeah and that's cool flipsidecanvas.com if you want to get some cool stuff to hang up in your house back to psychological warfare if you use that whole thing <laughs> as a playlist psychological warfare even if it doesn't apply to you you know you're not eating donuts while a playlist while you work out by the way even if you're not eating donuts while you work out which most of us do not it still it like it puts you in this mindset of like you know working and reaping results of work yeah it goes back to the podcast machete season when they talk yeah. about how the power of the audio into your ear yeah 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 that's what's happening with psychological warfare yes it's going right in your ear you're like you walk you get done listening to that you're not even thinking about the fact that you're thinking about the fact yeah you hear what i just said yes I you're did. not I even it. thinking about the fact that you are thinking about the fact that you don't even want donuts. <laughs> yeah. that you want to get in the gym that you want to attack your project oh yeah that's yeah. what's happening oh yeah it's true 100 percent true also 
while you're li- if you're if you're lifting at home, if we're doing the lifting at home, which I do, which you do, mm-hmm. which a lot of us do actually. People hit me up, show me their home setup. Awesome. You should have kettlebells, in my opinion. Kettlebells is one of the pretty much the biggest as far as changes to my workout, mm-hmm. the most valuable change that I changed my workout. Functionality. Functionality, like it's my a big hands buzz are word. One time I was doing, uh, you know how you gotta have, in jiu-jitsu you have wrist control, you know, and varying levels of wrist control depending on the position. Mm-hmm. There, I was rolling with a guy literally like he's like trying to release my grip from mm-hmm. his wrist or whatever, and like he's visibly angry because he couldn't. So I just sort of sat there and just let mm-hmm. him like do it, whatever. And how was his technique? Because technically he should be able to get out of that. Should. But I've been doing those kettlebells, so my <laughs> wrist control is a lot. Uh, we'll say the effectiveness is a lot higher. Nonetheless, my original point, kettlebells, this is where I get my kettlebells from, On it. So you go to onit.com slash Jocko. There you can get these kettlebells, and they're all the cool ones, too, by the way, like I always say. Darth Vader, my most recent one. Stormtrooper kettlebell, my second most recent one, and not to mention all the other primal bells and legend bells that I have from there also. At on it is the electrolyte mineral mix. That's part of my daily mega mix with Jocko's discipline. Like I said, the mineral uh, electrolyte mix, water, maybe a little Gatorade if if I'm feeling a little feisty. And oh, don't and that's how you take uh, joint warfare and krill oil. Don't 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 drink Gatorade, everyone. Don't listen to that. <laughs> Hey, we got some books too. We got Way of the Warrior Kid 3, Where There's a Will. It's out right now. And for everyone that's gotten it so far, awesome. Appreciate it. Write some reviews so that I know what you think of it. That That is cool. If you have Warrior the Work, Warrior, Way of the Warrior Kid 3, Where There's a Will, that means you should also have Way of the Warrior Kid 1 and 2. Number 2 is called Mark's Mission. Also, we got Mikey and the Dragons. Best children's book ever written, according to a lot of people. Sure, a lot. A lot of people. I dig it. A lot of people have been telling me that. I understand. Tons of people. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, check out Mikey and the Dragons. Help your kids overcome fear. Fear of all kinds. Also got the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. If you need to know how to get after it, if you want the audio version of that, it's on iTunes, Amazon Music, and Google Play. Also, we got Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership, written by myself and my brother, Leif Babin. Extreme Ownership. Mm -hmm. Number one selling business book since it got released. The whole time. We just got that little stat. Dang. It's kind of cool. That's a big stat. Yeah, yeah. Impressive. Some people tell me that Dichotomy of Leadership is better. Mm-hmm. It's a good combo. I'll leave it at that. <sighs> Echelon Front, that is my leadership consultancy. What we do is solve problems through leadership. It is me, Leif Babin, JP Dinell, Dave Burke, Flynn Cochran, Mike Strelly, Mike Bima, and Jason Gardner. If you need help in your organization with your leadership, which will help everything that you do in your business and in your life, go to echelonfront.com for details. If you want to come to the muster, you already missed Chicago. It was sold out. Your next opportunity is Denver, December, f- uh, or sorry, September 19th and 20th. That is going to sell out. And then December 4th and 5th in Sydney, Australia. If you want to come to it, sign up as quick as you can so that you can actually go and you don't get all mad. You'll be mad at me outwardly, but deep inside you'll know. Yep. That you hesitated and you procrastinated and you just didn't get your game on and that's why you're not at the muster So if you want to come to that check extremeownership.com EF online Leadership training is not an inoculation. It doesn't take one shot and now we're good to go You want to follow up with it and that's what you can do with EF online or if you can't make it to the muster for whatever reason go to EF online Online interactive leadership training Check that out, efonline.com. And of course, we have EF Overwatch. If you have a company and you want to get some good leaders that understand the principles of extreme ownership and they're going to apply them inside your organization, go to efoverwatch.com. We will deliver you a leader from the special operations community or the combat aviation community that is ready to step into a role and lead your company to victory. Also, if you want to hear more 
about important things like Hawaii Five-0 <laughs> or other highly intense shows sure. yeah. from Echo Charles or if you want to hear about leadership and war and human nature from me between the two of us we are on Twitter we are on Instagram and we are on D ah. Echo is at Echo Charles and I am at Jocko Willink and thanks to all the veterans out there especially those like John Stryker Meyer who volunteered and volunteered and volunteered again to do the hardest missions in the worst areas for zero recognition, by the way. Not even from your own friends and family. Those are true heroes and we are forever indebted to them. We are also indebted to police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all first respondents. Thanks for keeping us safe here at home and to everyone else. I know that life can be stressful. But chances are you aren't surrounded by elephant grass that is 12 feet tall and burning and closing in on you. Chances are you aren't being assaulted by NVA soldiers. Chances are you aren't facing death. But at the same time, actually, you are facing death. We are all facing death. So remember, like John Stryker Meyer said, every breath of air is sweet. And our gift is to be alive. So go out there and live. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.